London, and these are your top stories. European and US equity futures edge higher today ahead of key US CPI data that may provide clues on future Fed policy decisions. There is little tangible progress during yesterday's debt ceiling talks, but President Biden and Republicans pledged to continue negotiations in an effort to avoid a year US default. Plus, sources say Italy has signaled it will quit China's Belt and Road Investment Pact by year end amid escalating geopolitical tensions. Let's take a look then at the futures, pointing to gains of around two tenths of a percent, bit of a holding pattern, arguably, before that all important CPI print. The estimates are that you're gonna get 5% on the headline rate year on year for the month of April. The Asian session has been weak, in fact, setting up for the biggest losses in about two weeks across the major Asian benchmarks. Checking on the FTSE 100 at the open then, currently just down about a tenth of a percent. We have the BOE, of course, coming up in terms of its rate decision following, of course, the ECB and the Fed. The Spanish IBEX currently gaining four tenths of a percent. On the earnings front, some optimism coming through from the financials. ABN AMRO coming with a beat. Solid set of results as well for Credit Agricole. We'll get more on that story in this show. Continental as well, going to be speaking to their CFO in the second half of this show. They're coming out with solid numbers as well. So on the earnings front, a little bit of optimism. But again, it's the CPI print, inflation print, and what that tells us about the steer from the Fed that is going to be central for these investors. The FTSE 100 currently turning up a tenth of a percent. Similar picture over in France on the CAC Garant. Let's have a look at US futures then. You have the likes of Stan Druckenmiller, the former money manager, of course, for George Soros for about a decade, saying he does see a recession in the US and a hard landing. That the call from Druckenmiller. Futures in the US pointed to gains of two tenths of a percent. Euro dollar at 109, gaining a tenth of a percent. And at the front end of the two year, currently holding above that 4% level. Of course, the yield inversion continues. Brent, $76 a barrel. That's just down six-tenths of a percent. But has a floor now been put under these oil prices by the announcement that the U.S. will be looking to fill or refill its strategic reserves? Again, OPEC Plus as well, looking to their meeting in early June and whether or not they come through with another cut. That could prove something of a support for these oil prices. But again, Brent currently down around six-tenths of a percent in the session today, trading at 76.90. Two. Now, traders at Goldman and JP Morgan are expecting U.S. stocks to rally on any soft U.S. inflation print that could pave the way for the Fed to halt its tightening campaign. Both banks are pricing in a 2.5% S&P rally in the unlikely event of inflation easing below 4 and a half percent when that data is released later today. Very pleased to say we're now joined by Michael Metcalf, State Street Global Markets Head of Macro Strategy. Good morning, Michael. Thanks for joining morning, us in the studio. Do you take that view, or has the optimism been priced in to inflation? If you get a softer number, do markets rally? Yeah, I, th I think if you did get a softer number, the markets would rally. However... How I, soft would it have I, to be? I don't think we're going to get a soft number. Okay. Well. But in, ter in terms of how soft... I mean, look, yes, I mean, four and a half would be a big downside surprise in the annual rate today. Uh, so, so, yes, I, the market would rally on that. I just think the challenge right now, so, so we, we look at a lot of online data, uh, scraping retailers' websites, uh, and, and actually, if anything, it looks like there's an unfortunately an upside risk to the core inflation print today. Okay, so what would the market reaction be to that upside risk, do you think? Well, I, I think it's a little bit like payrolls. The Fed is in a really sticky place here because they're more than a year into their tightening cycle, and actually inflation, yes, the annual rate is coming down, uh, but look, core inflation so far this year, forget base effects, core inflation so far this year is running at an annualized rate of near 5%. And that still requires more tightening. And the market isn't priced for that yet. So I think that, that's our concern is that the data right now, the unemployment rate on like, last Friday 
and the inflation data we get this week is just running it's still a little bit too hot. Are you making the case then that the bar is not that high for the Fed to see a reason and the rationale to go again? Because there is a view that is starting to build that we're already in pause territory. Do you push back on that? No, I, I, I do think we're in poor territory because we're a year in. We're waiting to see the impact of the, the, the tightening we've seen so far. Um, what, what I do push back on quite strongly is the idea that the Fed is in any position to cut rates at any point this year. Okay, because the markets, some traders at least pricing in, the pricing of about 50 basis point cuts by, by the end of 2023. Uh, you would align then with the views that you can fade that, that pricing action? Correct, yes. Okay. The debt default discussions. Is there still a level of complacency within these markets? Is there a position that you can take to hedge against these risks? Or do you think ultimately they get it over the line and maybe you align with Bill Gross and say, look, buy T-bills at the short end? Yeah, I mean, look, I, I, I think it's difficult to get a gauge of, of, of how complacent or not markets are. The one thing I would say is that so we have measures of how institutional investors are behaving. And right now, investors are really quite defensive and mm. quite broadly defensive. Now, some of that might be the banking stresses, but I think some of that is investors just being a little bit wary that actually we don't get the outcome that we're hoping for on the debt debate. Stan Druckenmiller, then, he's called that you're going to get a recession in the US and it's going to be a hard landing. The consensus in terms of what we've been hearing from most executives and most money managers has been, OK, you may get a recession, it's likely, but it's going to be a soft landing. This is a view that it's going to be more dramatic than that. What is your sense of how much of a slowdown we could be getting in the US? So I'm, uh, I'm, I'm with my old friend Cameron Crees, who obviously is a, a Bloomberg yeah. columnist on this, who, who, who wrote, I think he wrote a nice piece yesterday, which I agree with, which is just that cash holdings in the economy are, are relatively high right now. So that, you know, the consumer's got, still got you know, excess cash, excess savings. Uh, corporates also have excess savings. Uh, and so I think you put those two things together, and it's difficult to imagine why you'd have such a hard landing, uh, given balance sheets of both consumers and corporates are in such good shape at the moment. Do you still think, when it comes to the banking crisis, or the banking woes, do you think we're, we're, you're still convinced that we're kind of past the, wor the worst of it? Mark Cardmore from our M Live team was making the case just a couple of minutes ago that the, the, the deposit moves are going to kind of start to, to reduce come June because people have made those decisions. How confident are you that the resilience is coming back to the banking sector, or do you think the stresses are still there? Well, look, I, I, I think there's still a level of fragility, and so clearly you can see that in the weakness in the, in, in, in the stock prices. However, one of the things, again, so going back to the behavior of long-term investors, actually they've been gradually moving money, or, or put it this way, they've stopped selling uh, the U.S. commercial bank sector. Uh, you know, they, 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 got a, they got themselves into a significant underweight position in the sector uh, at the end of last month. And this month, it's all been fairly stable. So it looks to us now that the, the residual fragility is quite speculative in nature. And I think fundamentals eventually win out. And so, yeah. So would you, would you want to buy regional, U.S. regional banks at this point? I, I wouldn't quite go that far, but yeah. I certainly wouldn't want to sell them. Okay, Michael, we're going to get more calls on the earnings front. Of course, we've got Credit Agricole came out this morning with some decent set of results. We'll get more of Michael's views in terms of the earnings picture and how that illustrates what is going across the corporate front. Of course, Michael Metcalf, head of macro strategy, State Street Global Markets, back with us in the next couple of minutes. Coming up, as I mentioned, Credit Agricole's investment bank posting a record performance in the first quarter. The FIC part of that business doing really well. We're going to bring you more of our interview with the deputy CEO, Jerome Grivet. That is coming up this is Bloomberg. So Fabian, talk to me a little bit about the ocean. It covers 70% of the planet. It gives us food. It gives us jobs. It, it gives us, of course, oxygen. We're taking too many fish out. We're polluting it. We're making it warmer. And only 3% of it is protected. What frustrates you the most about this? The basic frustration is our ignorance. Our ignorance about how integral ocean is to not only our well-being, but to uh, our existence. Uh, and for far too long, we've been using the ocean as an endless resource in a garbage can. Imagine 
our planet is a three-dimensional system, the ocean represents 99% of our world's living space, about 3.4 billion cubic kilometers of volume, within which the vast majority of biodiversity lives and thrives. And, and that's what we're beholden to. That is what makes us possible as a species. studios in new york and san francisco our expert hosts of the data and analysis about the companies you know and the startups to watch plus the interviews you don't want to miss watch caroline hyde and ed ludlow on bloomberg technology the only daily business show dedicated to tech right in the middle of the trading action 12 p.m on the east coast 9 a.m in the west only on bloomberg television your global business authority in a multi-trillion dollar industry, there's a lot of ground to cover. We indeed have a rally. We're talking a lot of dividends. We're talking income. We'll show you what's happening in ETFs like no one else. Bloomberg ETF IQ, Monday on Bloomberg. I think that it's hard to put your head around any narrative. Let's just be honest. We've had sort of a shift in, are we in some sort of stagflation fears moment? People were talking about that all day yesterday. Tomorrow. Bloomberg continues its coverage of the J.P. Morgan Global Markets Conference in Paris with an exclusive interview with J.P. Morgan CEO Jamie Dimon in the wake of the bank's purchase of First Republic. Join Francine Lacroix at 8.15 a.m. Eastern as they discuss the banking crisis, taming inflation, jobs, and more. It's all happening live on Bloomberg Television and Radio, your global business authority. Happy Wednesday. Welcome back to the Open. Ten minutes into the European Trading Day. It is CPI Wednesday, of course. We're leading up to that important print in terms of inflation out of the U.S. later today. You're seeing modest gains of about a tenth of a percent across the European benchmark. Futures in the U.S. also pointing higher after the downside that we saw yesterday. S&P E-mini is currently up two-tenths of a percent. A couple of individual stories to bring to your attention on the earnings front and some optimism in terms of of the numbers that have been coming through from the likes of Continental, ABN AMRO, and Credit Agricole. Let's start with Continental then, and we're going to be speaking to the CFO in about 20 minutes' time. You can see the pop there of around 4% on the back of a profit gain in the first quarter, and expected improvements, particularly around supply chain improvements and production as well. Earnings rising around 35% to a little under 580 million euros in the quarter for Continental. ABN AMRO, decent set of numbers as well. This is beating the street in terms of the view. 2.7% is the gain there so far in the session. First quarter beat boosted by lending income, so net interest income doing well for ABN AMRO and setting aside less in terms of loan provisions as well. Executives saying that, that credit quality remains solid and credit agricole. The traders, particularly in the fixed income, commodities, and currencies section. So FIC doing really well for this French lender. Currently up 4% on the back of some very solid numbers, posting a record performance in the first quarter and beating out many of their larger rivals with a 42% gain in the FIC part of that business. We'll be getting more on that shortly. Credit Agricole's Investment Bank, as I say, coming in with a very solid set of numbers. The deputy CFO has been speaking to Bloomberg exclusively a little early. Take a listen. Again, we've been able to capture uh, a lot of customer opportunities. We haven't been taking any additional risks, and indeed, the value at risk, for example, that we posted for this quarter was slightly decreasing as compared to the previous quarter. Uh, but definitely, our teams are able to seize opportunities uh, towards our customers and to be relevant in their commercial proposal that they are able to make to the clients. So definitely, this proves that we are able to be here towards our customer and to propose the relevant solution, be it in debt capital market or hedging products. What's your estimate for the total amount extra that you might have to pay in back taxes if, to settle the, the Kum Kum scandal? I'm not going to comment any uh, discussion that may or may not take place between us and different public authorities. But uh, what I can just say is that securities lending and borrowing is a business that has a, an economic uh, uh, ground that is perfectly justified for economical reasons. And in this business, we have actually a very small market share. It's a small business for us. 
It's a small business. When can we ha hope to have any resolution on how much back tax will be payable, Jerome? Do you have any visibility I'm on that? I'm not able to comment any further on this question. The projections are for, for global growth to go into a much tougher period over the next 12 months. We're near the end of the ECB cycle. So roughly in big picture view, what is your outlook for the European economy for the rest of this year? And what do you see as the terminal rate from the ECB? Where is that in your projections? I'm not a, a specialized ECB watcher, so I'm not able to say exactly where they are going to end this hiking cycle. But as you said, we are closer to the end of the cycle rather than to the beginning. It's absolutely clear and probably middle of this year, in the summer, we will see a stabilization of the rates level. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, economic uh, uh, outlook, actually, we've been able, as of now, to avoid a recession in Europe. Uh, five or six months ago, everybody was just asking the question, when is the recession going to take place? And now it seems that recession is going to be avoided, despite the fact that we are seeing a slowdown in the, mm. in the economy in Europe and in France. But uh, we do not expect a recession, and we continue to see some positive elements here and there globally in the economic outlook. So we are, we are quite positive, actually, in the medium to long term. Okay, that was Credit Agricole's deputy CEO, not CFO, CEO, Jerome Clivet, speaking exclusively to Bloomberg's Anna Edwards and Mark Cudmore early. Let's bring back Michael Metcalf then of State Street Global Markets, who remains with us. Michael, your view on the earnings front. Were we overly pessimistic about the numbers coming through for corporate Europe and the resilience, particularly around margins? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think you have to remember at the start of the year, you know, we thought there was a, a recession in Europe guaranteed and didn't think that earnings factored that in. Uh, and I think what we've learned both from the macro data and the earnings data in Q1 is actually that, you know, yes, a recession might still be coming, uh, but it looks to be quite mild so far. And, you know, and maybe even the recession isn't guaranteed. And I think earnings, the earnings stories that we're getting and the beats that we're getting are all kind of reinforcing that. Are you re-rating your views on, on earnings in, in future quarters as a result of the numbers that we've seen come through so far? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think there's a bit of a tension between yeah. quite pessimistic investor sentiment and, and probably slightly better fundamental news that's coming in. So, so it, 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 it's certainly a balance and it's making us a little bit less defensive. Are we yeah. in a world now where European banks are the standout? As we look at the US and the challenges there, are European banks now the headliner for us? I mean, we've seen again Credit Agricole, AB and AMRO, these teams are doing well on the trading front, and this is before the investment part of these businesses is coming through with any kind of real traction. That's going to come at some point, surely, the IPOs, the M&A, the underwriting. FIC trading has proven very strong. They're benefiting from net interest income. Are European banks still a play? Well, look, I, I, I think there's been a, a, you know, look, a, a relative play here for a while where, where you know, US banks had been doing better because of slightly lighter regulation. Europe had been struggling in a heavier regulated environment. And I think now we're definitely getting a rebalancing on that because obviously we know in the U.S. that regulation is now going to come. And obviously the U.S. banking stresses are still there, whereas Europe seems to be doing well. So on a, on a relative basis, yes, Europe looked much better. You remain overall defensive in terms of your portfolio. Yeah. Where does that lead you? And what would you need to see? What would the catalyst be for you to turn less defensive, more constructive on these equity markets? Okay, so I think, I think on, 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 on that last point, yes. I, I think we'd like to see more positive investor sentiment, which, which at the moment, it, you know, it's still very defensive, particularly uh, you know, uh, negative flows into cyclical stocks in particular. And so I think that the, um, the recession question needs to get resolved one way or another. And I think to the, the Druckenmiller question that we had, you know, e even if we get a slowdown, we need to get some confidence that it's going to be fairly shallow. So that might take a little while. The one thing I would just note on being defensive, so yes, we've got kind of uh, you, know, you know, you know, very classic defensive plays like like uh, you know, like utilities or you know maybe even energy on the cyclical side if you if you want to go in, 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 into something more exotic. Um, but the interesting thing for us is emerging markets. Actually, uh, you'd think in this environment that emerging markets would be a, a classic defensive play and you'd be underweight. But actually, we're seeing money go back into EM right now, which I think is, is really that a valuation call? Is that a, a, a China catalyst call? What what is driving and pulling that money into EM? Yeah, you know, I I, I think it's a combination of investors being underweight. It's valuation. It's China. It's, it's all of those things together. But I think also as well that emerging markets are further through their tightening cycle. Yeah. We're more confident, and actually and now we're beginning to think about when emerging markets can start cutting rates. And so I think it's actually they're they're to some degree ahead on the inflation cycle. So I think that plays a. Would you as well. lean into that? 
Yeah, absolutely, yeah. So, so we're defensive, but with a few little barbells of, of, of risk-seeking activity in emerging okay, markets. Really interesting. Michael Metcalf, thank you very much indeed for the take and the analysis on all things markets, of course, for us this morning. State Street's global markets head of macro strategy. Let's get the Bloomberg Business Flash now and what we're expecting in terms of some of these top stories. Elon Musk saying that Twitter has not signed a deal of any kind whatsoever with Tucker Carlson. The ousted Fox News host earlier posted a video saying he's starting a new show on the social network. He was fired, of course, by Fox last month after a lawsuit uncovered evidence. He had insulted management, colleagues and guests. Musk tweeted that Carlson would be subject to the same rules and rewards of all content creators on the platform. Boeing says it's optimistic it will soon restart stalled exports of its 737 MAX jets to China. CEA CEO Dave Calhoun says air travel is surging there and Beijing needs more planes now. It's ended pandemic measures. Earlier, the US jet maker announced an order from Ireland's Ryanair for as many as 300 of its largest 737 MAX model. Shares of Airbnb dropped sharply in extended trading after it gave a cautious revenue forecast. The vacation home rental company says revenue could grow 12 to 16% in the current quarter, its slowest pace of growth on record. This warning, the number of nights booked will look unfavorable compared with a year ago when there was a surge in post-COVID demand. And it's your Bloomberg Business Flash. Coming up, former UK Prime Minister Tony Blair warns Labour not to get complacent ahead of the next general election. We're going to hear much more on that and more from our interview with the former UK Prime Minister. This is Bloom. exception in finance, not the rule. Morningstar has taken an in-depth look at women in the industry, and the numbers are startling. The firm found that in 2020, women made up 14% of global fund managers. That's largely unchanged from the year 2000. Morningstar also calculated that while the number of women at the top of the corporate ladder has increased, it won't be until 2060 that women will reach parity with men in the C-suite. Studies have shown that increasing the number of women managers leads to better decision making and moderates overconfidence. European Central Bank President Christine Lagarde insists that male domination of the banking industry made the 2008 collapse of Lehman Brothers more likely. As Lagarde put it, if it had been Lehman sisters rather than Lehman Brothers, the world might well look a lot different today. done a pretty good job of, of pulling the Labour Party back from, from where it was. I mean, remember in 2019, it was just about the worst defeat in the, the Labour Party's 120-year history. So, you know, we've, we've come back a long way, and he's done an excellent job, I think, of leading the Labour Party. Um, but 
of course, you, you can't be complacent about these things at all. You know, the polls may show him uh, in the lead. The local election results were pretty good, really. <clears throat> Very bad for the Conservatives. But you, you don't take anything for granted. OK, that was, of course, former UK Prime Minister Tony Blair giving his thoughts on Labour leader Keir Starmer in an interview with Bloomberg from the JP Morgan CEO Forum in London, an interview with Lizzie Burden, our UK correspondent, who joins us more for a take on this interview. And it was a wide-ranging interview, uh, Lizzie. What, for you, were the key takeaways? He gave his views there on the political landscape and the implications for Labour, but he also talked about China and a number of other topics. What stood out to you in terms of your conversation with the former UK Prime Minister? Well, it was really brilliant to get his perspective, given that he is the most electorally successful UK Prime Minister alive, uh, given that we've just had local elections here in the UK in which the opposition Labour leader Keir Starmer didn't get the double-digit vote share lead that he needed to get, according to pollsters, to secure the landslide victory at the general election next year that Tony Blair won in 1997. So as you heard there, Blair's take is he cannot afford to take anything for granted. He is doing a good job, but there's more policy detail to come in the pipeline. And of course, Blair, we know, is advising Keir Starmer as he tries to gear up for government. The other interesting thing for me was about Brexit. We know that Tony Blair has spoken out against leaving the European Union in the past. He said there's work to be done to address the hangover effect from leaving the European Union, especially for the City of London. He says that there is a risk the city could lose altitude as a result of Brexit. So I thought I'd be cheeky and ask whether his son Ewan Blair should list Multiverse, his company, in the UK capital. He didn't want to uh, give his advice, but he did say that it looks as if a, a London a, London list, a listing in general for Multiverse was some way off, which would be interesting for watchers of Multiverse, given you and Blair stands to make hundreds of millions of pounds. Well, it's a unicorn, and it's a very successful one at that. So it's an interesting question. I like, And I like his line around the city of London, uh, that, you know, finance, the word of finance may not be that popular across the nation, but the importance as it in terms of a driver of this UK economy. And you talked about geopolitics, and you talked about his views on China, and maybe how they've evolved as well. I remember when I was on the ground in Beijing, living and working, reporting there for around five years, talking to diplomats at the UK embassy and their frustration that there wasn't a China strategy coming out of the UK. Are we starting to see that? Is that something that Blair is pushing for? What are his views on the relationship between London and Beijing? Well, of course, he now heads up the Tony Blair Institute for Global Change. Uh, and his view on China is you've got to stand up for them, take to, to them, stay, take a strong position, but you cannot afford to decouple from China or to treat them like the Soviet Union. Take a listen to what he said. You know, is a by reason of its civilization, its population, its technology, and its economy, it's, it's going to be a big world power. The question is how we live with that in a changing geopolitical 21st century. And my view, as I've always said to people, is you've got to be strong enough to deal with whatever comes out of China, but you should stay engaged with China. And so I don't agree with decoupling, and I don't agree with the notion that you treat China like the, the, the Soviet Union, because it isn't. OK, former UK Prime Minister Tony Blair there speaking, of course, to our UK correspondent Lizzie Burden, giving his views on how the UK should be viewing its relationship with China. Let's briefly check in on these markets then before we get to the end of this segment. Currently, you're seeing range-bound trading across European equities. Not a great surprise, given, of course, that there's going to be a lot of sitting on hands before that CPI print out of the US. The forecasts are for 5% on the headline level in April year-on-year. -year. Coming up. Continental seeing further improvements in results for the year as the automaker recovers from severe supply chain woes. We're going to speak to the CFO next. This is Bloomberg.
not going to be relying upon countries whose values we don't share. To the world of business. It's all about corporate power of the end. Balance of Power, live from Bloomberg's Washington headquarters. We're going to be more excited at what's in store for you. How long will it take? How many years? Why don't we take this one day at a time? Good luck. Everybody has a perspective. Every weekday at 5 p.m. Eastern time, join hosts Anne-Marie Hordern. It's the one area, really, of bipartisanship. Well, I think we're getting more of it. That's an optimistic. And Joe Matthew. The debt ceiling is looming. How close are we going to get to the line before you start to worry? Alongside Kaylee Lyons. The door was open for regulators to do more. And that puts the Fed between a rock and a hard place. As they deliver news. This is such an important economic issue. He's Bless no me. longer trying to run away from that. That really blew some minds. Insight. We can both invest in law enforcement and also make sure that communities feel safe in their own skin. And analysis. I think your audience will get this more than most. It's not the Republican Party that you know. It allows him to do what he did so successfully in 2020 which is run against crazy. From and about politics' biggest power players. This was the zombie case, and it's now more than well alive. That's for sure, uh, with two more potentially to come. I'm willing to have this battle. It is vitally important. This is the intersection of Washington and Wall Street. Bringing people directly to the decision makers right. that impact your investments and your life. Balance of Power, every weekday at 5 p.m. Eastern, only on Bloomberg, your global business authority. Welcome back to the Open. We are 30 minutes into the European trading day. And here are your top stories. European stocks and U.S. equity futures edge higher ahead of key U.S. CPI data that may provide clues on future Fed policy decisions. There is little tangible progress, though, during yesterday's debt ceiling talks. But President Biden and Republicans pledged to continue negotiations in an effort to avoid U.S. default. Plus... Sources say Italy has signaled it will quit China's Belt and Road Investment Pact by year-end amid escalating geopolitical tensions. Let's check in on these markets then as investors, of course, await the U.S. inflation prints, the forecast of 5% year-on-year on the headline rate for the month of April. J.P. Morgan Goldman Sachs gaming out the scenarios if it comes lower or higher, what it means for these equity markets. Here in Europe, then, you're currently unchanged. There's a little bit of optimism, though, coming through on the earnings front, particularly from the likes of Credit Agricole, Airbnb, AMRO, and Continental. And that's a story we're going to unpack in just the next couple of minutes. The DAX, of course, in Germany, currently down 13 points. The FTSE 100 flat as things stand. Banks getting 9 tenths of a percent in your sectors. Real estate also up 8 tenths of a percent. Those are the leading sectors. Bottom on the list, you've got personal care, health care, Retail prices all down between four tenths and seven tenths of a percent. But there is definitely a sense of a holding position taking the lead here as we await that inflation print. Of course, what it means for the Federal Reserve and the decision making there, Stan Druckenmiller saying that the US is heading for a recession and he's expecting a hard landing. A bit of a bleak session over in Asia, by the way. Losses of a more than 1% across the Shanghai Composite and the Asian session looking to its biggest losses in about two weeks. Let's get to what is happening, though, on the geopolitics in terms of Italy and China. Italy signaling to the U.S. that it intends to pull out of China's controversial Belt and Road Initiative before the end of the year. The country signed onto the Infrastructure Pact in 2019. It was the only G7 nation to do so. For more, let's get the context from Bloomberg's Maria today. Maria... In terms of this decision, I remember being in Beijing when this happened, Chinese officials touting Italy's signing on to the BRI and hoping, of course, that it would open the floodgates for other European countries. That didn't happen. What is going on? What is behind this potential decision from Italy? Uh, yeah, Tom, and, and it's a very good point, and it is very good context. We have the story, of course, on the Bloomberg terminal, which suggests that the Italian Premier, Giorgia Meloni, has told, uh, namely the United States, that they will not renew the Silicon Belt Road, and that means that Italy could 
potentially leave uh, before 2024. And now the context, as you say, it's important. And so is the timing. Remember, in 2019, the Italian government, really, this was a shocker, took everyone by surprise by saying we are breaking away from the G7 consensus and joining the Silicon Belt Road. And we know very well this is not just infrastructure spending and it's not just a business project. This is really political and a diplomatic web for the Chinese. And that was the implication and part of the shock at the time. Now, the argument from the Italian government of Giuseppe Conte, who signed uh, this deal, was that this made economic and financial sense for the country, that it would open the way for exports, and that it would be good for made in Italy. But I would point, however, that change uh, in relationships and in the tone of the country started already two years ago with uh, Mario Draghi, who talked about the strategic interest of Italy, who talked about potential dangers that could come uh, with Chinese investment this idea that you have to really scrutinize the money that comes from Beijing. Nothing is a gift. Nobody gives you something in life uh, for free. That's something that he used to say. Now we have Giorgio Meloni potentially saying this will be the end of it, but it is a complicated uh, situation for the Italian Prime Minister because on the one hand, obviously it would be welcomed by the G7. Italy is also a NATO country, a member of the European Union, but also she has to really handle this with great care because she cannot uh, embarrass the Chinese. Basically, that's, that's the issue here. She has to provide a way out for the country if she were to do this, but also at the same time, a platform for the Chinese to almost save face. So this is, it is a tricky balance. Yeah, China's going to want a way, have a way to, to spin this, certainly. Maria, what is your sense? I mean, if you take into account the comments that we've had from Olaf Scholz, of course, the Chancellor of Germany, slightly more hawkish comments in terms of his interpretation of the German relationship uh, with China, and now this decision by by Italy, potential decision. Does it tell us that Europe is now more unified, that they are coalescing around a strategy on China? Uh, look, I think that's a very tricky question, and the China question is, of course, uh, well, there's many opinions on it across uh, the European Union. But overall, what it would signal, however, is that there has been a fundamental rethinking when it comes uh, to China. And this is obvious to me from the Brussels perspective. It has been almost ever since Angela Merkel left. And you've seen the China-EU trade deal. Remember, that was signed at the end of 2020. That's not been ratified. And the idea is that it's not going to be ratified anytime soon. Obviously, you add the geopolitical tensions, the war in Ukraine. Remember, uh, the Europeans could potentially include Chinese companies in the new uh, sanctions package if they perceive they're helping Russia in the war effort. And almost this idea that at one point, what is trade and what is politics? Can you do trade and politics or actually do they have to go uh, separate? Remember, Angela Merkel was a big believer that the more you trade, the more you have a political relationship that is solid. With the war in Ukraine, that theory has really been well thrown out the window. Indeed. Excellent reporting, as ever, and the context really crucial. Maria Tadeo, of course, with the latest on that plan, potential plan for Italy to pull out of the Belt and Road Initiative. Let's get the Bloomberg First Word news now and a roundup of other top stories. A New York jury has found that Donald Trump is liable, was liable, for sexually assaulting and defaming writer E. Jean Carroll. The court ordered the former president to pay $5 million in damages after she accused him of assaulting her in the 1990s and defaming her by calling her a liar when she wrote about it. It is the first verdict against Trump in a string of cases that threatened to erupt during next year's presidential campaign. He called the verdict a political hit job. Pakistani opposition leader Imran Khan is to appear at an anti-graft tribunal later today after his dramatic arrest sparked violent clashes across the country. Khan was taken into custody yesterday in relation to a case involving a land deal. Khan's party says at least four people were killed and 20 injured in fighting with security forces. The US has announced a $1.2 billion package to bolster Ukraine's air defenses and ammunition stocks. The aid also includes satellite imagery services and equipment to integrate Western systems. This after Russia's President Vladimir Putin vowed to press on and win the war during yesterday's Victory Day parade in Moscow. That is your first word news. Coming up, President Biden and House Speaker McCarthy made little progress on averting a first ever U.S. default. What can we expect then ahead of their next meeting at the end of the week? We're going to discuss that next. This is Bloomberg.
Steve's ability on the course may not be etched into any record books, but no, following him around, no, it's clear no, that it's no, not for lack of trying. Jeez. We were constantly hustling behind him as he caught up with executives in the portfolio companies and reminisced with former and current players. He's a day trader. He taught himself, self, self-made day trader. Yeah. And so he's on the bus after a game in New England, and he's day trading on the bus, and Bill Belichick sees him and cuts him on the spot. You know, in many ways, it's a convention, right, of the people that I don't see maybe once a year. And so it's kind of all come together. My firm, our charity, our fundraising efforts, and then the friends that are around. My dad and my brother, it all happens right there as a confluence of all these parts of my life that have found its common center. global economy is changing as the world recalibrates. After decades of stagnation, Japan's leaders are forging a more innovative and sustainable path forward to revitalize the nation. Corporate giants, policymakers, and pioneers tell us how they're doing just that. Every week on Japan Ahead, right here on Bloomberg Television. BSO Now is your online home for weekly Boston Symphony Orchestra and Boston Pops performances. See new concerts that go behind the scenes, plus acclaimed archival concerts. Visit bso.org slash now, where the music plays on. BSO season sponsor, Bank of America. Welcome back to the Open. We are 40 minutes into the European trading day. European stocks currently turning down by two-tenths of a percent. But on the earnings front, there is some optimism coming through. And one of the stories that is lifting at least the stock, the news around Continental and its profits coming in higher than expected. Trading high this morning, up 4%, a little over 4%, as profit gained in the first quarter. The auto supply expects further improvements during the year as production recovers from severe supply chain problems. Very pleased to say that Continental's CFO, Katia Durfeld, joins us now for the take on these earnings. Katia, uh, a decent set of numbers. Investors are happy, at least this morning. What underlines the optimism that you are now seeing in what is otherwise a challenging macro environment? Yeah, hello, good morning, Tom. Thank you for having me today. Um, in general, I would say we started solidly into the year 2023. And as you already announced, we expect further improvements um, during the course of this year. Why is that? Um, there's one driver is um, the increase in uh, production, for sure, um, that, that we still do see and expect um, on the automotive side. And what we also do see is that the measures that we've taken um, have really already manifested in our in our earnings and that we do expect to increase even further we are still negotiating pricing um, with our OEM customers to compensate for the uh, for the um, cost inflationary headwinds and we've already been able to conclude some of these um, during the course of the first quarter what is different to the year before that's what makes us where, um, where, positive where are those? that we will improve the earnings yeah. during the course of the year Katia, where are the main pain points then when it comes to inflation right now? Is it, is it labor? Is it logistics? Is it transport, energy? What stands out to you? It's a little different from sector to sector. So for this year, we do have the biggest impact um, on our automotive sector still. We expect a, an impact of around 1 billion in cost inflationary headwinds for automotive. Their material still plays a major role, um, especially for the electronic components. But we also have inflationary headwinds coming from salary, um, from logistics, and partially also from energy. Um, for the rubber part, we do not see that much cost inflationary headwinds from the material side anymore. There, we definitely do see the labor side, the energy side, and the logistics side. Okay, interesting. And you're obviously working on the pricing because margins coming in at 5.6%, suddenly above the estimates of a little under 5%. So 5.6% margins. Is there further upside there, Katia, on margins, or are you starting to top out? Well, in general, those 5.6 are the starting point, the solid start, so to say. As I already mentioned, we expect um, to 
to become better during the course of the year. This is also why we confirm our full year's guidance that, that we've laid out uh, for this year. So um, we will see improvements in, for example, automotive. So for automotive, we do expect to improve quarter by quarter um, on, on, the, uh, on the margin side. Contitech has done a big step compared to the Q4 um, margins. Um, for tires, we will see how, how it will develop during the course of the year. You've seen that we are even a little above the guidance with the first quarter. There we do expect to see some some drops, but still confirming the guidance that we've laid out for the year. Tesla cutting prices obviously has been a major story. The CEO of Ford has warned potentially of, of price wars within the auto sector. It, how immune is Continental to a price war in autos if that's where we end up? That is it. That is it. Interesting question to ask. So what we do see on our side is that still on the auto side, we are the biggest um, supplier of electronic components. Um, we are a requested partner of the automotive industry. You could also see that we had, again, a very high order intake in the first quarter of this year um, with around 6.6 .6 billion. So we are th thought by the automotive industry, by the technology that we are able to deliver. We have announced that we do have further price increases to talk about already late last year. This is where the negotiations are ongoing, and this is also what we will need to, to achieve and to further work on. Um, last year, we've been successful with the negotiations with our customers, and I still don't see any, any change in the behavior with our customers in, during the course of the negotiations. We will have to continue. We continue to negotiate, but we've mm. also been successful already during the Q1. Okay, there have been a lot of expectations uh, before the end of last year around, around the potential for China as it kind of reopens and recovers. But now there are question marks, really, in terms of the, the appetite for consumers there to go out and spend on big ticket items. Production has been challenging, sales have been challenging in China. Is, is that still a tailwind for you, or is China now proving a headwind? We will have to see how the whole situation in China really, really develops. We are also in China working very closely with the Chinese OEMs and for sure also with the European OEMs. There, we were in line with the expectations so far. Um, on the replacement side, on the tire side, we will, uh, industry side, we will have to see how the trend develops. Um, but overall, we are still okay with the expectations we had for China this year. Talk to us about how comfortable are you around Katia as you crunch the numbers for this business on the investments in, in autonomous driving, long promised and yet a long way still from fully autonomous. It is an increasing part of the business. Uh, do you push back on the investments in that part of business? When, when do you expect that to really hit the bottom line and start to turn things profitable for Continental? So thanks for the question, because I think especially on the autonomous mobility side, there, there, there have been good news or there are great news out there at the moment. So we were able to get uh, a big order um, on the autonomous uh, side for 1.7 billion euros um, for a radar system. Um, that, that is a great sign, and it's also a big development and a big step into the right direction. This is exactly where we had focused also um, our investments in on the autonomous side. And you also heard that we have announced our new partnership with Aurora, where we will bring autonomous trucks on US roads in 2027. So I think what we currently do see is a manifestation of the investments that we've done there. Um, the additional investments were already considered, so this is nothing new to, to I would say, to worry about. Um, so um, overall, I think we are on the right track, we're on the right path, and uh, we are getting the orders for the new technology that we have on hand. Okay, and you obviously have products, you have services and products around, around EVs, but also around ICE uh, engines, combustible engines. Is, is the profitability coming through as you would expect for the EV part of that business? How do you expect those two sections to perform in the quarters ahead for Continental? Mm. Um, maybe one thing to clarify a little bit, Tom, we are not that powertrain dependent anymore. With the spin-off of Vitesco Technologies, we've severely reduced our dependency on the powertrain itself. So the technologies that we have on hand that we do provide now are it, to a really large extent powertrain independent. So when um, EV grows, that is perfectly fine with us. And we also have some products that are especially good in the EV, in the EV uh, part of the business. But overall, currently, we do not worry too much about where the things go. Um, we have the technology on hand, and with the spin-off of Vitesco, that was definitely also the right strategy to reduce powertrain dependency. 
Okay, Continental CFO, Katia Durfeld, we appreciate your time and your take on the back of these earnings. It was a beat for Continental. The stock currently up 4% in the German market. Coming up for the world's money managers, Turkey's election outcome could determine whether the country becomes a buy again. We look at what's at stake for the nation. That is next. This is Bloomberg. Back in 1997, I was interested in the following question, which is, there are a bunch of the dinosaurs called sauropod dinosaurs, which had really long skinny necks. So Apatosaurus is an example. They also had really long skinny tails. So I made a computer model that showed that in fact, the tail of these sauropod dinosaurs could actually act like a whip a bullwhip. Now the way a bullwhip makes that cracking noise yeah. is because the tip of the whip actually goes about twice the speed of sound. Okay. I think the way they got a date was to impress the females by making loud booms. From London, in Sydney, from Washington, Tokyo. 9 a.m. in Beijing, in Shanghai. Good morning, everyone. Have a great evening. Here's what I'm watching. You do not want to miss this story. Is there the kind of upside? Against the backdrop of a troubled economy, Turks will either extend President Recep Tayyip Erdogan's rule into a third decade or offer his main challenge with a chance to steer Turkey towards a reset. The country has been in the midst of a cost of living crisis and many blame the president's unorthodox economic policies as inflation peaked above 85% last year. Turkish central banks still cut interest rates on Erdogan's orders. Turkish lira has cratered by more than 75% against the dollar since the last election. Many foreign investors have left. Six opposition parties are banding behind Kemal Kılıçdaroğlu, a left-center career civil servant who promises to bring a fresh start to the economy. Most of his career, Kılıçdaroğlu's party has failed to win at the polls, but in 2019, his party unseated incumbent mayors in large cities, including in the capital Ankara and in Istanbul. Today, there are national figures campaigning on Klitschdorov's behalf. President Erdogan, meanwhile, will look to the heartlands once again, where he is viewed as a strong leader that the country needs to guide them out of hard times. Competing platforms could not be more different. On May 14, the voters will decide. Okay, Bloomberg's Yusuf Gamaladin reporting on what is at stake in Turkey's presidential vote. Very significant indeed for that nation and the geopolitics of the region. Over to the U.S., meanwhile, President Biden and congressional Republicans say they will hold further talks on raising the debt limit as they attempt to overt a first-ever U.S. default. For more, we're joined by Bloomberg's Kevin Whitelaw. Kevin, where did the talks leave us then? They came out and said not a lot of traction during the conversations, but they are meeting again. Is that the silver lining? 
Uh, you know, I think never, no one expected the first talks to resolve anything. I think that was an opening discussion, and I think Biden did seem to signal that there's some openness to conversations about spending cuts, which is the demand that, that Republicans have made for, for raising the, the debt ceiling. They still remain extremely far apart. Keep in mind, the, the Republican version of a debt ceiling bill, you know, it contains something like $4.8 trillion worth of spending cuts and obviously targeted a whole bunch of Biden's core uh, you know, programs, including his whole, you know, Inflation Reduction Act, green tech subsidies. So, you know, that's a non-starter for the White House. They're still pretty far apart. Biden came out saying we're not going to default. McConnell, the Republican um, Senate leader, came out saying we're not going to default. But ultimately, it's going to be up to McCarthy, the House Speaker, and, and the House Republicans. And that is an extremely difficult bunch of lawmakers for him to wrangle and cut uh, a deal with that, that Biden can possibly accept. Yeah, so explain something to me, because we're talking about the incentives for each side to maybe strike a deal, and there's a view from some that McCarthy's being held hostage by these right-wingers in his party. Some would characterize them as extremists. Does he need, in terms of the mechanics of the politics and how this gets across, does he need their votes, ultimately, to, to get this through, or is it just a case of maintaining his position? No, I mean... The Republicans have set themselves up in the House with, with this um, idea that's now been a decade in practice where they don't pass bills unless they have enough Republican votes to pass them. Mm. So um, it is not a, it's not like an actual rule, but it's their own political rule. And debt ceiling votes are among the most sort of complicated and difficult ones politically because it does sort of you know, come at the heart of, of, of what Republicans are talking about when they talk about spending priorities and, and fiscal priorities. The last two Republican leaders in the House have had their tenure ended, at least in part, by votes that raised the debt ceiling without the kinds of concessions from Democrats that, that the party had, had demanded. So um, it is a very, it's a party that has, um, it is basically very hard line when it comes to this. Um, and McCarthy has to be very careful. If he cuts two um, you know, to, to, to a deal that they view as, as sort of giving the Democrats too much, it really could actually endanger his ability to, to remain as Speaker. Okay, Kevin Whitelaw, really important context from someone who spent a long time in the weeds on U.S. politics in D.C. with the context on what's happening with this default ceiling and debt default, as there are plans, of course, to meet again on Friday. Thank you, Kevin. Let's check back in on some of the movers on the earnings front. As a, 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 The macro picture, the top-line picture is these equity markets are kind of sidelined, down two-tenths of percent on the broader markets as we await the details on U.S. inflation. But on the earnings front, it's a reminder that there is at least resilience in some of these corporates in this challenging macro environment. Continental coming out with a beat in the first quarter, the stock rallying 3.5%. We we're speaking to the CFO there on their relative optimism. They're seeing an increase in terms of production. They have the pricing power for now and margins coming in much higher than the estimates as well. Expectations that really margins can go higher as well in the future quarters for Continental. ABN AMRO, really optimistic around the net interest income beat there on higher rates. Loan provisions less than expected. 2.5% is the gain there. And Credit Agricole, a record quarter for this French lender. FIT coming in very strongly, gains 5.6%. That is it for the European market open. Surveillance Early Edition is up next. This is Bloomberg. How can you prepare to be the National Security Advisor or to serve your government in some way? 
The biggest piece of advice I try to give young people is um, to reject certitude. Uh, what I mean by that is that no matter how good you think your argument is, or your policy position, or your proposed course of action, it almost certainly has weaknesses or blind spots, and you should acknowledge those. I think actually sometimes saying, you know what, I was wrong, you were right, is actually a more powerful show of intellectual strength than just sticking firmly by your position. Doesn't mean you should compromise your principles or your values, but the easy decisions do not rise to the White House, the hard decisions do. And those hard decisions have two sides um, that are not 100-0. come down in Europe from the financial centers of the world. Bloomberg Markets European Close with Guy Johnson in London and Alex Steele in New York. Real-time numbers, real-time analysis, weekdays. When U.S. jobs numbers are released, Bloomberg brings you crucial data at terminal speed and instant expert analysis. Nobody covers jobs day like Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Francine Lockwood. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in Paris, and here's what's coming up on today's program. European stocks muted as cautious investors await U.S. CPI data that may provide clues on future Fed policy decisions. Little progress in averting a first-ever U.S. default, but President Biden and Republicans pledge to continue talks on the debt limit. Plus, Bloomberg sources say Italy has signaled it will quit China's Belt and Road Investment Pact by year end amid escalating geopolitical tensions. So, good morning, everyone. Happy Wednesday. I'm here in Paris ahead of J.P. Morgan's annual Global Markets Conference, just a week and a half after it took over the troubled U.S. bank First Republic. Now, tomorrow I'll sit down exclusively with J.P. Morgan Chief Executive Jamie Dimon. That's at 1.15 p.m. London time on Thursday. Now, the conversation is not only going to be about banks, but in general, we'll ask him about market sentiment and, of course, everything that's going on with the U.S. Uh, default and debt ceiling limit concerns. Now, the market's uh, pretty cautious ahead of that U.S. CPI number. That should and will give us a good indication on future Fed hikes or not. European stocks also a little bit cautious. Again, if you look at banks, the strongest performers, certainly amongst European stocks, uh, Crédit Agricole, higher following a record first quarter for the French firm's investment bank. And then, look, if you look at the inflation figures out of the U.S., they're definitely top of mind for investors. The report expected to show headline CPI rising by 5% in April on a year-on-year -year basis, still well above 2%, that level targeted by the Fed. European stocks down 3 tenths of 8%. Now, President Biden and congressional Republicans say they will hold further top on raising the debt limit as they attempt to avert a first-ever U.S. default. Everybody in this meeting reiterated the positions they were at. I didn't see any new movement. The president said the staff should get back together. The staff will get together and we'll get back together the principals on Friday. We explicitly asked Speaker McCarthy would he take default off the table. He refused. The United States is not going to default. It never has and it never will. Well, for more, let's bring in Bloomberg's EMEA News Director, Ross Matheson. Ross, if you look at where we are right now, so no tangible progress, but they will continue talks. So what do you make of it? Well, that's right. I mean, they met for just one hour yesterday, and that was their first meeting since February. So no one was really expecting them to come out and say, yes, we've struck a deal. It's not in their interest, really, to announce a deal uh, yet, This, you know, when we're still some way from June the first, but what we are seeing at least is the ability to get in a room together and have a conversation and the desire to keep talking. And we'll look for sort of further signs of meetings into next week. The question is, does that force the US president to defer 
or cancel his travel uh, to Asia. He's due to go to the Group of Seven Summit in the middle of next week and then on to Australia and Papua New Guinea. If this is reaching a crescendo at that point or if there are signs that they're getting towards a deal, does he need indeed to stay home and deal with that? Uh, and that's one thing we, we really need to look for, any indications that he's changing his travel plans. But at least we know they are willing to talk. There are some signs they're trying to find some way to compromise without giving in too much on the on the really contentious issue, which is the spending question. Republicans want to cut spending significantly. Democrats don't want to. But can they tack other things onto a deal that would make it amenable uh, to get, this, get some sort of agreement through Congress more broadly? And that could involve perhaps uh, support for fossil fuels, for example, or agreeing to claw back some of the pandemic aid. So, so those are some of the signals we need to look for really over the next 48 hours. Yeah, and for the moment, the market is just looking at these intensified negotiations and kind of putting some of the worries to one side. What's the incentive, Roz, of reaching a deal before June 1st? Well, there are incentives to do so, and there are incentives not to do so. Of course, the biggest incentive is the damage it could do to the U.S. economy. You don't want to be president when hundreds of thousands of, of workers lose their jobs because of this. You don't want to be Republicans going Good into election. traders. How are you doing today? Um, I'm going to place, as you, if you remember, uh, yesterday I placed order to sell short United States dollar. Uh, it didn't reach, and it only right now uh, I removed in the morning, and right now it reached the level 109.59. So I placed order to sell short at 109.59. Okay, so. Here is the uh, situation right now. Let me, I will try to adjust the contracts I have uh, opened and you will see what will happen if I will get sale to. position open and here is on the, in a blue line the order placed to sell all three contracts i will calculate uh, 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 afterwards when it will get uh, when i will get filled uh, how much profit we made um, uh, from our calculation it will be quite decent profit so uh, stay with me and through this but it's still going down. Maybe I will increase my stop loss even further. Okay, guys. I'll speak to you later. Stay safe. what the market could do today. We've been looking at uh, JP Morgan's forecast, for example. Basically, under 8% good, uh, over 8% bad seems to be their call. And extre extreme results over 8% could produce some pretty hefty amounts of volatility and some pretty sharp moves in the equity markets, partly I think because, you know, investors have sort of like taken their eye off the ball a little bit in terms of the CPI numbers. So, Paul, and again, if you look at indices, certainly in the U.S., they they seem to be ranging or, you know, trading range-bound in a pretty narrow range since, again, they're, they're just trying to figure out this inflation versus recession outlook. Yeah, and, and so that's the, the longer term thing is, what's the new catalyst that we're going to get? I think we're all still a little bit uh, shaken from the turmoil that we've seen in the banking sector, uh, those regional banks, you know, has that gone away? You know, the market took quite extraordinarily the uh, news that PacWest was cutting its dividend by 96%. Uh, as a good news sign, you know, they're getting to grips with their capital requirements, uh, they're shoring up reserves, this is a good thing. But if all of the banks are going to need to cut their dividends by that much, that can't be terribly good news for the banking system overall, and it can't, as you were saying, be very good uh, news for the, for the likelihood of the banks extending more credit to customers in the second half of the year. So looking at how fast that slowdown is going to come, you know, whether at least inflation can come down at the same time and give the Fed room for cuts. Otherwise, if we move into that stagflationary environment, which nobody wants to see, then that's some real danger and could cause much greater turbulence right across our asset classes. Yeah, and Paul, in terms of some of the market moves, so we talked extensively about what happened to the price of oil, and then T-bills, if you look at yields on Treasury bills, so definitely surged. Is there another part of the market mm. that you think is particularly interesting? 
Yeah, yeah, and that's all to do with the debt ceiling, as Ros was uh, discussing earlier, you know, and whether a compromise can be reached. So we're seeing some of these short-term uh, bills, those uh, for four weeks and then out to sort of the, the uh, middle of August, trading with this big premium in terms of yields because people can't hold them uh, in instances where they're worried about a default. And so that's creating this kind of um, skew in the market, this kind of... Uh, uneven looking curve as well with people trying to price in those various default risks and probabilities. Now with yields above 5.4% for early July, you know, the market has never seen interest rates on those tenor bills as high. Partly it's a function of the fact that, you know, they haven't been around that long and Fed rates have been so low for so long as well. But also there is that embedded risk premium. And that tells you that although at the moment, you know, it's not the sort of thing that's really moving major asset classes in a big way, it is rising up the list of worries uh, for global investors and something that they're going to have to spend time and money and effort evaluating, even if it does all work out in the end. Paul, thanks so much. Bloomberg's executive editor for markets, Paul Dobson. Now, we'll have plenty more, of course, on the markets throughout the day. Inflation day in the U.S. Markets keeping a close eye for clues into the Fed's next decision. Here in the U.K., we also get a BOE decision tomorrow. So we'll discuss both next, and this is Bloomberg. So Fabian, talk to me a little bit about the ocean. It covers 70% of the planet. It gives us food, it gives us jobs, it gives us, of course, oxygen. We're taking too many fish out, we're polluting it, we're making it warmer, and only 3% of it is protected. What frustrates you the most about this? The basic frustration is our ignorance. Our ignorance about how integral ocean is to not only our well-being, but to uh, our existence. Uh, and for far too long, we've been using the ocean as an endless resource in a garbage can. Imagine uh, our planet is a three-dimensional system. The ocean represents 99% of our world's living space, about 3.4 billion cubic kilometers of volume, within which the vast majority of biodiversity lives and thrives. And, and that's what we're beholden to. That is what makes us possible as a species. Business Week Radio, live weekday afternoons at 3 p.m. Eastern. We got a little bit of talk. Come on, are you guys ready? Harnessing the power of Bloomberg Business Week, Carol Masser and Tim Stanovac bring you the latest news from the worlds of business, technology, politics, and more. How does the Fed play into this and what the Fed yeah. does potentially? This is so exhausting and this is so all-encompassing. Listen on Bloomberg Radio and streaming on YouTube and Bloomberg Originals. continues its coverage of the J.P. Morgan Global Markets Conference in Paris with an exclusive interview with J.P. Morgan CEO Jamie Dimon in the wake of the bank's purchase of First Republic. Join Francine Lacroix at 8.15 a.m. Eastern as they discuss the banking crisis, taming inflation, jobs, and more. It's all happening live on Bloomberg Television and Radio, your global business authority. Finance politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in Paris. Now, on to the markets and billionaire investor Stan Druckenmiller says he thinks the U.S. economy is teetering on the edge of a recession and he predicts a hard landing. Now, amid those economic concerns, strategists are increasingly calling for stock market declines. Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, and Bank of America all see the S&P 500 ending the year 
at 4,000 or below. Well, joining us now is Josie Anderson, Managing Economist at the UK Centre for Economics and Business Research. Thank you, Josie, for joining us. There is this dichotomy, this thing that we can't really quite figure out, that a lot of the predictions, certainly on the economy front, is that we see a recession, but markets are holding quite strong. Who's right, Josie? Yeah, well, it's a tough call to make because there are so many forces at play at the moment. So, yeah, in the US, we've got inflation coming out today, and that's expected to, to stop declining. We've seen this deceleration for nine consecutive months, but in today's data, we're expecting it to remain at 5%. So you've got fears, yes, that inflation will stop declining. We want it to be at 2%. Um, but then we've got the GDP growth, you know, and that was really disappointing in the latest data as well. So that's kind of another negative sign, a 1.1% annualised rate. Um, we're forecasting 0.8% GDP growth over the year as a whole in 2023 compared to 2022. So perhaps it could avoid a recession, but two consecutive quarters of contraction aren't outside of the realm of possibility. But overall, we think it's going to be a weak year. No, not like a really terrible year, but... A lot of this depends on, of course, what happens with banks. We've seen this financial sector turmoil, um, which is really worrying the Fed. And, and this, is, I think, is the big risk factor. Yes, we've got weak GDP growth. Yes, we've got possi possible um, rise in inflation. You know, certain flatlining in inflation is what's expected. Um, so there are so many forces at play. Whether or not we might see a recession this year, I think, is the big question. And it's really, really difficult to say for sure. Yeah, and Josie, I have to say, I've seen so many charts, and I'm looking at so much in the charts about credit, the labor market, that my eyes are actually a little bit square to match the charts I look at. How does the Fed look at the credit crunch? So far, they've been able to keep the banking crisis to one side and said, look, we're dealing with inflation. Is there a moment where interest rates, you know, could deal with the banking crisis and, and the credit crunch? Yeah, so it's, it's a really tough question, and I think the latest meetings, notes, and statements were, were quite interesting. Uh, because the Fed, at first, was saying, you know, we can deal with this credit crunch, we've got to focus on inflation. But now they're saying, look, credit tightening, banks being less willing to lend is possibly having the effect of higher interest rates anyway. You know, banks are, are nervous. They're, they've seen the difficulties in the sector at the moment. And now they're, they're less willing to lend, you know, credit tightening. Um, and, and so, in a way, that, that is artificially kind of equivalent to increasing rates, and so now the Fed is much more hesitant. Okay, guys, as you can see, position closed on euro is against United States dollar. Well done, all of you guys who traded, uh, who followed my trade, copy them. Uh, we made the profit, uh, or it all depends how much you decided to invest uh, in a contract. Our contracts one pip uh, equals one hundred pounds. So uh, I'll show you how much we made. If you want to find out how we trade, if you do paper trade, please uh, send me email or you have plenty of information on our YouTube website or company website and you can find uh, all the information you need, how, we, uh, how to trade, how to register for webinar, okay? I'll speak to you later and have a great day. We're still about to continue to take action. But similarly in the UK to the US, the question is, will they stop now? And I think the answer is possibly yes, um, you know, for similar reasons, really. Um, we are expecting inflation to come down. I think that's extremely likely for similar reasons as to why the US has already seen a decline. Uh, but wholesale energy prices falling is passed through at a slower rate to consumers in the UK. So in the next few months of inflation data, we will see it start to decelerate. Um, and so hopefully the Bank of England will then be able to say, look, inflation is coming down anyway. We don't need to continue to take so much action. And the Bank of England will similarly be concerned that if they keep on raising rates by too much, that they'll push the UK economy into negative growth rates. Um, and so, yeah, they're kind of all performing a balancing act at the moment. Yeah. But are we now in a second round effect of inflation that will be much harder? I mean, it's sticky, but also it, it seems that maybe they've, they've lost control of a lot of the narrative in the UK. And what does that mean for a growth plan for Great Britain going forward? Yeah, 
that. So if inflation starts to rise again, you know, core inflation, I think, is the key thing to look at, because if that's rising, even though energy is bringing the, the top line rate of inflation down, that is a big concern, because that is showing that inflation might be sticky. You know, the labor market in the US and the UK still remains very tight. That's concern for workers being able to bargain for higher wages, um, and then inflation remaining high, not probably not at 10%, but even if it remains at 5 or 6%, that's still much higher than the Bank of England's target. And, and they will have to continue doing something about that, even if they want to stop raising rates now because they're nervous about a recession, they're nervous about the banking sector. Um, if they just don't show any control over inflation uh, because they stop raising rates, then it returns to kind of accelerationary periods. Um, then that would be a big, big concern. So the Bank of England will have to worry uh, if they see inflation start to tick up again. Josie, thank you so much for all the insight. Josie Anderson, their managing economist at the Centre for Economics and Business Research. Now, coming up, Franz Timmermans, the European Commission Executive Vice President, uh, talks exclusively on the climate crisis, and he really has a pledge for finance and investors. We'll hear that interview next, and this is Bloomberg. exception in finance, not the rule. Morningstar has taken an in-depth look at women in the industry, and the numbers are startling. The firm found that in 2020, women made up 14% of global fund managers. That's largely unchanged from the year 2000. Morningstar also calculated that while the number of women at the top of the corporate ladder has increased, it won't be until 2060 that women will reach parity with men in the C-suite. Studies have shown that increasing the number of women managers leads to better decision making and moderates overconfidence. European Central Bank President Christine Lagarde insists that male domination of the banking industry made the 2008 collapse of Lehman Brothers more likely. As Lagarde put it, if it had been Lehman sisters rather than Lehman Brothers, the world might well look a lot different today. Bloomberg UK, your source for news and analysis covering the biggest challenges facing the UK government, economy, financial services and markets. Tax cuts should not be the priority. It's about a credible plan for growth over the next two, three years. In this post-Brexit world, how do you see actually servicing your clients? It was disruptive and it's going to have implications to how capital raising works. Now we're having the perfect storm in the UK. Watch Francine Lacqua Thursdays at 9.30 a.m. only on Bloomberg, your global business authority. This is the crisis that uh, tops all of them uh, because it's an existential crisis. You know, you can with AI, you can take more time. Uh, with wars, you can take different views. With economic transition, you can take also more time or do it differently. But the climate crisis doesn't give us any time. Uh, we have to desperately try and reach 
a situation where we don't go beyond the 1.5 degrees Celsius, because otherwise we'll reach a couple of tipping points, and then the situation will get completely out of control. I can feel your frustration. Why are we so slow to this? Well, I think it's, it's such a fundamental transition in a time already with so many uncertainties that the human reaction, completely understandable, is to be more careful. But we don't have the luxury to be more careful. We have to be bold. We have to step forward. We have to do it now. So what does that look like? Is it more financing? Is it private companies? Is it more regulation? Is it politicians being more enticing? It's all the above. It's all the above. It's a challenge that nobody can avoid embracing. We need to make sure investments get going much faster. We're too slow. It has to be public investment, but we're talking about trillions, so it also has to be massive private investment. But for private investment to come in, we need to give assurances that this money will not be lost, that the risks are manageable, and we can do that. Energy transition is the best example. That's going so fast, and it's a no-brainer. Investing in renewable energy is the clever thing to do. How much money do we need for the transition? Are we going to get it, and in what timeline? Well, we need trillions a year. Uh, and it's a mind-boggling number of, of uh, uh, amount of money. But at the same time, these trillions will start um, releasing profits very soon after the investment. Because the energy transition, the transition towards a circular economy, liberating ourselves of the dependency on fossil fuels, it's going to create a huge new economy. And by the way, it's also in the middle of an industrial revolution. So new technologies are coming to the table every day. It's such an exciting time. It's a scary time, but also an exciting time with all these new technologies. Well, that was Franz Timmermans, European Commission Executive Vice President, uh, talking to me exclusively about what is needed on the climate crisis at Bloomberg's Future of Finance conference here in Paris. Now, let's get straight to the Bloomberg. First word news, and a New York jury has found Donald Trump liable for sexually assaulting and defaming writer E. Jean Carroll. Now, the court ordered the former president to pay $5 million in damages after she accused him of assaulting her in the 1990s and defaming her by calling her a liar when she wrote about it. It's the first verdict against Trump in a string of cases that threatened to erupt during next year's presidential campaign. He called the verdict a political hit job. Pakistani opposition leader Imran Khan is to appear at an anti-graft tribunal later today after a dramatic arrest sparked violent clashes across the country. Khan was taken into custody yesterday in relation to a case involving a land deal. Well, Khan's party says at least four people were killed and 20 injured in fighting with security forces. And the U.S. has announced a $1.2 billion package to bolster Ukraine's air defenses and ammunition stocks. The aid also includes satellite imagery services and equipment integrate to integrate Western systems. Well, this after Russia's President Vladimir Putin vowed to press on and win the war during yesterday's Victory Day parade in Moscow. So we'll have plenty more of our top stories. We have CPI today, so we look at the markets. Also coming up, a bit of advice from a former central banker to a current one. We hear from a former MPC BOE member. He has some words of wisdom for Jay Powell. That's next, and this is Bloomberg. on the course may not be etched into any record books, but no, following him around, no, it's clear no, that it's not for lack of trying. Jeez. 
we were constantly hustling behind him as he caught up with executives in the portfolio companies and reminisced with former and current players. He was a day trader. He taught himself, self, self-made day trader. Yeah. And so he's on the bus after a game in New England, and he's day trading on the bus, and Bill Belichick sees him and cuts him on the spot. You know, in many ways, it's a convention, right, of the people that I don't see maybe once a year. And so it's kind of all come together, my firm, our charity, our fundraising efforts, and then the friends that are around, my dad and my brother. It all happens right there as a confluence of all these parts of my life that have found its common center. Concerns about sticky inflation are fueling bets the Bank of England is set to raise rates again. But will BOE Governor Andrew Bailey signal a pause or more hikes to come? We always have to be very focused on how do we sort of bring these various pieces of policy making into alignment so that they work together. Tune in to Bloomberg for live coverage of the BOE decision and following press conference. Today, starting at 12.15 p.m. London time, right here on Bloomberg, your global business authority. Welcome back to Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. Good morning, good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. Welcome to Bloomberg Markets, trying to open. This is Bloomberg Technology. And welcome to Balance of Power. This is Bloomberg. European stocks lower as cautious investors await U.S. CPI data that may provide clues on future Fed policy decisions. Little progress on averting a first-ever U.S. default, but President Biden and Republicans pledge to continue talks on the debt limit. Plus, some Bloomberg sources say Italy has signaled it will quit China's Belt and Road Investment Pact by your end amid escalating geopolitical tensions. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in Paris. Now, the focus, of course, is on central banks. Tread carefully. That's the message for the Bank of England from Sushil Wadwani, now a former member of the Central Bank's MPC. He's currently a member of UK Chancellor Jeremy Hunt's Economic Advisory Council. Now, Bloomberg asked him what to expect from the Fed and the possibility of a U.S. recession. I think the best way to interpret the rate cuts that are priced in is they're pricing in uh, some sort of event which with maybe a 20 or 30 percent chance, which then requires the Fed to move very aggressively, uh, you know, by cutting by two or 300 basis points, not just the three rate cuts that are priced in. So uh, I think, you know, one always has to recognize the limitations of one's knowledge and the possibility of there being some unknown, uh, hitherto unknown accident in the U.S. financial sector, which then requires the Fed to move very aggressively, or indeed that the debt negotiations go so badly that you get meaningful fiscal tightening, which then requires the Fed to respond uh, by cutting rates meaningfully. So we shouldn't uh, discount these possibilities. Also, a recession can come very quickly. You know, think of it as a sort of wild E. Coyote moment, uh, and you're, you're suddenly in a recession, and the Fed then does respond. So uh, I wouldn't completely dismiss market pricing at this point if you think about it as being bimodal. That is mm. the most likely scenario uh, where the Fed doesn't cut, and then this tail risk scenario where the Fed has to cut a lot. A bimodal market, a very black and white outcome when it comes to things like the debt ceiling. Sushil, have you had to rethink, of course, your trading strategies, they are quant in nature, um, they have these automated inputs, but, but have you had to rethink the models? Have you had to rethink those inputs in this type of bimodal environment? I think we, one always has to refine one's models over time. Uh, economics is not physics. And it's very important to ensure that one is responding to new information and structural changes. So, for example, in 2020, uh, we meaningfully 
uh, revamped our models in, in, in the light of various things going on. Uh, you know, vaccines became relevant. Uh, money supply growth was uh, at very high levels. And so we clearly did need to look uh, again at our models. Now, in this current environment, we are very aware that the latter stages of a tightening cycle are quite treacherous. And therefore, for that reason, we uh, keep portfolio risk at lower levels than normal. We've always done that. Well, that was Sushil Wadwani on UK Chancellor Jeremy Hunt's Economic Advisory Council and also Chief Investment Officer of PGM Wadwani speaking earlier. Now, former UK Prime Minister Tony Blair has also some advice for the Labour leader, Keir Starmer, ahead of the next general election. Well, he spoke in our interview with Lucy Burton. Lizzie joins us now. Lizzie, so what message did, did Blair actually give Keir Starmer? Well, it was really interesting to get Tony Blair on Francine because, of course, he is the most electorally successful prime minister in the UK who's still alive. And, of course, we did just have those local elections at which the new Labour leader, Keir Starmer, didn't, didn't get the double-digit poll lead uh, vote share majority that he needed, that polling experts would say he needed, to get a landslide at the next general election a la Tony Blair in 1997. So Blair's advice to Starmer is, yes, you're doing well, but you cannot afford to be complacent at this point. And he said that we can expect a pipeline of more detailed policy announcements before that election. Of course, we know that Blair is advising Starmer as he hopes to gear up for government. The other thing that I would just point out from that interview was on Brexit, because, of course, we know that Tony Blair has been openly anti-leaving the European Union. We've done that now. But he said that for the city of London, there is a risk that it loses altitude if the government doesn't work on equivalence and pay all that attention, the hangover from Brexit. So I asked him, would you advise your son, Ewan Blair, to list multiverse here in the UK capital? He didn't want to say either way, but he did say that that IPO is some way off, which is interesting for watchers of multiverse, given Ewan Blair stands to make hundreds of millions of pounds from an IPO. He's done a pretty good job of uh, pulling the Labour Party back from, from where it was. I mean, remember in 2019, it was just about the worst defeat in the, the Labour Party's 120-year history. So, you know, we, we've come back a long way, and he's done an excellent job, I think, of leading the Labour Party. Um, but, <clears throat> of course, you, you can't be complacent about these things at all. You know, the polls may show him uh, in the lead. The local election results were pretty good, really. <clears throat> Very bad for the Conservatives. But you, you don't take anything for granted. So that was Tony Blair on uh, Keir Starmer. We also talked geopolitics. We asked, I asked him about the special relationship because, of course, it was pretty special when he was in Number 10 Downing Street. Uh, and more recently, Joe Biden didn't come to the UK for the coronation, and he spent more time in Ireland than the UK when he was here for the Good Friday Agreement anniversary. He says that the US-UK relationship does need strengthening on a political level, but not on an institutional level. That stays strong. On China, he said that we shouldn't be decoupling, that it shouldn't be treated like the Soviet Union, because it isn't, but that the UK does need to stand up to China where necessary. Take a listen. China is a, by reason of its civilization, its population, its technology, and its economy, it's, it's going to be a big world power. The question is how we live with that in a changing geopolitical 21st century. And my view, as I've always said to people, is you've got to be strong enough to deal with whatever comes out of China, but you should stay engaged with China. And so I don't agree with decoupling, and I don't agree with the notion that you treat China like the, the, the Soviet Union, because it isn't. So the former UK Prime Minister, Tony Blair there. Lizzie, thanks so much. Lizzie Burden there with the great interview of Tony Blair. Lizzie, of course, our UK correspondent. Now, Bloomberg has also learned that Italy has told the US that it intends to pull out of China's Belt and Road Initiative before the end of the year. Now, the country signed up to the Infrastructure Pact in 2019, the only G7 nation to do so. Now, for more, let's get to Bloomberg's Rome Bureau Chief, Alessandro Speciale. Alessandro, this is a great Bloomberg scoop. Why would Italy make such a move? First of all, let me be clear that no final decision is made. There have been 
a few high-level meetings between top Italian and top US officials. Speaker McCarthy was in Rome, met with Meloni. Prime Minister Giorgetti, who was in the US, and met with Secretary Yellen. The mood noise, the vibes uh, were good from the Italian side. Italy signaled that it will eventually pull out of this pact, which is due to be renewed by the end of the year, but no final decision has been taken. Why would it be important? Because Italy is the only G7 country that signed so far to China's Belt and Road Initiative. It happened under a different government with very different political leanings, and of course, it's something that the U.S. are looking very closely. And also, Italy didn't get much of this, except for the embarrassment with its international peers, so to say. All right, Alessandro, I think we're having a little bit of technical difficulties, actually 100% um, he hearing you, so it happens sometimes. We'll probably get back to you to have more on this great Bloomberg scoop. Of course, it will have implications for the Blanc and beyond. So, so we'll get back to Alessandro Speciale as soon as we can. Now, a couple of other news that we're looking for. SBB erasing, SBB erasing gains, falling as much as 5.6% after the chief financial officer has sold some of the shares. So we'll get more on that also shortly in our stocks to watch. Again, the CFO, Evalotta Street, has sold some 3.6 million um, Swedish krona of shares. They held around 0 0.9 million shares. So look, th there's, there's quite a lot going on with SBB. Don't know if we have the share price. Maybe we'll get that up for you to see exactly what it's doing right now. Coming up, Turkey holding its general election this Sunday. What's at stake for the ballot box? We're live in Istanbul next, and this is Bloomberg. advisor or to serve your government in some way the biggest piece of advice I try to give young people is um, to reject certitude uh, what I mean by that is that no matter how good you think your argument is or your policy position or your proposed course of action it almost certainly has weaknesses or blind spots and you should acknowledge those and I think actually sometimes saying you know what I was wrong you were right is actually a more powerful show of intellectual strength than just sticking firmly by your position. Doesn't mean you should compromise your principles or your values, but the easy decisions do not rise to the White House. The hard decisions do. And those hard decisions have two sides um, that are not 100-0. No one covers the world like Bloomberg. It would be, of course, a total disaster for Emmanuel Macron because he's been elected on this reform and he would have to basically start from scratch. It definitely is an exciting day for Apple. First store in India, here in downtown Mumbai, a second one coming up in Delhi. TK, we've got a lot to talk about. Debt, China, and the shockingly cautious view the IMF has on the view five years forward. Bloomberg, your global business authority. Against the backdrop of a troubled economy, Turks will either extend President Recep Tayyip Erdogan's rule into a third decade or offer his main challenge with a chance to steer Turkey towards a reset. The country has been in the midst of a cost of living crisis and many blame the president's unorthodox economic policies as inflation peaked above 85% last year. Turkish central banks still cut interest rates on Erdogan's orders. Turkish lira has cratered by more than 75% against the dollar since the last election. Many foreign investors have left. Six opposition parties are banding behind Kemal Kılıçdaroğlu, 
a left-center career civil servant who promises to bring a fresh start to the economy. Most of his career, Klitsch Darolo's party has failed to win at the polls, but in 2019 his party unseated incumbent mayors in large cities, including in the capital Ankara and in Istanbul. Today, they are national figures campaigning on Klitsch Darolo's behalf. President Erdogan, meanwhile, will look to the heartlands once again, where he is viewed as a strong leader that the country needs to guide them out of hard times. Competing platforms could not be more different. On May 14, the voters will decide. Well, that was Bloomberg's Yusuf Kamel Din reporting on Turkey. So we have plenty more, of course, on Turkey. The elections in Turkey have wide-ranging implications for the Middle East and Europe. For more, let's get straight to Bloomberg's Turkey Bureau Chief, Onur Ant. Ani, Onur, thank you for joining us. So what are exactly the implications of Turkey's domestic and foreign policies if there's a change in leadership after the election? Well, a lot depends on the outcome of Sunday's elections. Uh, on the foreign policy front, we know that Erdogan has uh, pursued a very assertive and increasingly in independent regional foreign policy, especially in the second half of his uh, two decades in power. Should he get reelected, we expect to see more of the same, obviously. But in the case of an opposition win, we expect to see a reset in ties, especially with the US, uh, the West, and the European Union. Uh, I should remind you that Erdogan's foreign policies have often been in clash with those uh, entities, especially the US and the European Union uh, over the last few years, uh, and especially so on Syria and some other regional issues. So uh, if the opposition gets reelected, we do expect a reset in a relationship with NATO uh, and with the US. And we do expect Turkey to put a bit of a distance between itself and Russia and possibly retire yeah. some of the uh, uh, more recent uh, Russian military hardware that it purchased from Moscow. So Honor, what would be the impact actually of a change of leadership on the economy of Turkey and the investor sen sentiment? Well, there will be an adjustment in Turkey's economic policy after the elections, no matter who the winner is. Now, who wins will determine the scope and the pace of that adjustment. Uh, according to Bloomberg Economics, there is going to be a very swift adjustment in economic policy, and the implications will be uh, significant for markets in the case of an opposition win. We expect a, a return to more orthodox monetary policy settings, uh, and that would be coupled with an untangling of the uh, web of regulations that the Turkish Central Bank has built around its markets, around uh, Turkish lira markets over the last few years. In the case of an Erdogan win, however, that adjustment will still take place, but the exact uh, uh, shape of it and the speed of it will be determined by what happens between now and, 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 and after the elections. Honor, thank you so much. Bloomberg's uh, Turkey Bureau Chief, Honor Ant, of course, as we await that election in Turkey. Now, let's get straight to your Bloomberg business flash. And, of course, a lot going on in U.S. politics. But we start with Elon Musk saying Twitter has not signed a deal of any kind whatsoever with Tucker Carlson. The ousted Fox News host earlier boosted a video, posted a video, saying he's starting a new show on the social network. Now, he was fired by Fox last month after a lawsuit uncovered evidence he had insulted management, colleagues, and guests. While Musk tweeted that Carlson would be subject to the same rules and rewards of all content creators on the platform. Boeing says it's optimistic it will soon restart stalled exports of its 737 MAX jets to China. The chief executive, Dave Calhoun, says air travel is surging there and Beijing needs more planes now it's ended pandemic measures. Earlier, the U.S. jet maker announced an order from Ireland's Ryanair for as many as 300 of its largest 737 MAX models. Now, shares of Airbnb dropped sharply in extended trading after it gave a cautious revenue forecast. The vacation home rental company says revenue could grow 12 to 16 percent in the current quarter, its lowest pace in growth of growth on record. Now, it's warning that the number of nights booked will look unfavorable compared with a year ago when there was a surge in post-COVID demand. So that's your Bloomberg Business Flash. We'll have plenty more on business and, of course, on markets. Also, the year next chief executive, Stéphane Bougna, says protests in Paris have no material impact on the city's ability to be a financial center for Europe. Well, he spoke exclusively to Bloomberg from the sidelines of the Future of Finance Summit here in Paris. Everyone understands perfectly that in the world of yesterday, uh, London was the largest financial center of the European Union. This time is over forever, and, uh, and Europe, the single market, uh, had to develop uh, a sort of integrated network of uh, connected uh, financial centers. 
and Paris is one of those. So Paris is, is a strong financial center, but it is, above all, like Amsterdam, like Milan, like Dublin, a gateway, an entry okay. gate to the single market. France, in particular, is having a lot of protests, very much so in Paris. Does that take the shine off of this? I, I don't think it had uh, many material impact. I mean, any, all the European countries had to reform the welfare state, education, public services, and pension, and have done that over the past uh, uh, years through various uh, uh, channels and through various, uh, in various formats. France is a vibrant and sometimes vocal democracy where these type of things happen when there is a fundamental change in resource allocation. So I don't think it, it materially changed the fundamental assets of Paris, of Amsterdam, of Milan, of, of, of Dublin, because what really matters is what? The depth of the talent pool, the strength of the, and the diversity of the, of the ecosystem, the fact that you have an, uh, uh, an, a very unique concentration of, of, of large cap companies in the same location. I mean, this, all these fundamental assets, all these fundamental features of Paris make, make it relevant irrespective of surface uh, uh, um, noise related yeah. to, to reforms that happened everywhere in Europe. Well, that was your next chief executive officer, Stefan Bouzna, speaking exclusively to Guy and Alex from the sidelines of the Future Finance Summit here in Paris. Now, coming up, we have plenty more on the debt ceiling. Some of Wall Street's most experienced traders warned of unthinkable consequences from a default and argued that the debt limit may need to be permanently repealed. We'll have plenty more on that shortly. And this is Bloomberg. So Fabian, talk to me a little bit about the ocean. It covers 70% of the planet. It gives us food. It gives us jobs. It, it gives us, of course, oxygen. We're taking too many fish out. We're polluting it. We're making it warmer. And only 3% of it is protected. What frustrates you the most about this? The basic frustration is our ignorance. Our ignorance about how integral ocean is to not only our well-being, but to uh, our existence. Uh, and for far too long, we've been using the ocean as an endless resource in a garbage can. Imagine our, our planet is a three-dimensional system. The ocean represents 99% of our world's living space, about 3.4 billion cubic kilometers of volume, within which the vast majority of biodiversity lives and thrives. And, and that's what we're beholden to. That is what makes us possible as a species. studios in New York and San Francisco. Our expert hosts have the data and analysis about the companies you know and the startups to watch. Plus, the interviews you don't want to miss. Watch Caroline Hyde and Ed Ludlow on Bloomberg Technology, the only daily business show dedicated to tech right in the middle of the trading action. 12 p.m. on the East Coast, 9 a.m. in the West, only on Bloomberg Television, your global business authority. Merci. 
said all along. Let's discuss what we need to cut, what we need to protect, what new revenue we can raise, and how to lower the deficit to put our fiscal house in order. But in the meantime, in the meantime, we need to take the threat of default off the table. Well, that was U.S. President Biden after a meeting with congressional leaders over the U.S. debt limit. But how are markets reacting to this tension? Well, let's bring in Bloomberg's Markets Today executive editor, Christine Aquino. Christine, when you look at the market, I mean, first of all, they seem a little bit range-bound, partly because of CPI. They're waiting for that. But what the, the Fed's messaging so far has been, when do they freak out about the debt ceiling? Well, Francine, as we've seen in previous episodes of the debt ceiling drama, markets really don't freak out until it's the absolute uh, last moment for them to get a chance to freak out. I mean, we know that they are notoriously bad at pricing political risk, which this is largely being treated as such at the moment. But, you know, we are hearing from prominent uh, market figures like Bill Gross just talking about the issue. And at the very least, we are seeing kind of the sort of trades, right, that you would make in this sort of situation. I mean, Bill Gross himself, while he claims that he's not particularly worried about the issue, and he calls it ridiculous in his words, uh, he does say that it makes sense to go into shorter duration assets, your treasury bills that kind of give you that yield advantage without exposing you to longer term risk. Uh, and then we also have prominent Wall Street banks like Goldman Sachs raising the alarm, writing a letter to Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen, and really just emphasizing that the U.S. cannot default on its debt. It's going to be disastrous. So we're hearing soundings of it now, and I think once more markets kind of get to critical mass, uh, and once it gets to that breaking point, then I think that's when we'll see that very pronounced market reaction. So, Christine, how much volatility are you expecting in general in the next couple of weeks? Tomorrow we have BOE, of course, CPI in the U.S. Today we had some pretty discouraging or worrying figures out of China earlier this week. What are they going to focus on next, if not the debt ceiling? Well, Francine, of course, as you mentioned, the U.S. CPI report today, very important. I, I know that traders are going to be looking out for some of the key components in there. We're expecting some increases in things like used car prices and gasoline. That's going to be very important indicators, especially because we're about to head into the summer driving season in the U.S. So that's going to be a, a good kind of indicator in terms of how consumers are going to weather these higher prices. And then, of course, the housing component as well. And, you know, I think really investors kind of keeping an eye on where it goes from here uh, in terms of the Fed's response, right? Because we've seen still while inflation and that rate has come down both on the core and headline, it stayed very, very sticky at a 5.7 to 5.5% range. And so this, again, I think really drives on the point that the, the first part of the Fed's job, the easy part, is done. It's getting that uh, core inflation and that headline inflation back to the 2 percent target. It's going to be very tough. And so far, we haven't really seen much progress in that front. Christine, thank you so much for all of the insight. Bloomberg Markets today, editor Christina Aquino. For the moment, if you look at stocks certainly in Europe, uh, they're seeing a little bit of pressure. Uh, they're sliding, edging lower ahead of that U.S. CPI data. Now, just a reminder, J.P. Morgan holds their annual Global Markets Conference right here in Paris. And tomorrow, we'll sit down for an exclusive interview with the bank's chief executive officer, Jamie Dimes. So don't miss that interview. We'll talk about banks. We'll talk inflation. We'll talk, of course, about the debt ceiling and everything in between. This is Bloomberg.
middle of a massive exhibition center located on the western suburbs of Shanghai, where the annual car show is taking place. This is the first exhibition after the end of the COVID lockdown. We can feel a lot of uh, excitement on the ground. Electric vehicle is going to be the new theme of the industry. Most of the European companies and Japanese car makers who are considered latecomers to the China EV party are you know, launching their EV products. Uh, they are making their foray intensifying competition in the market. Uh, for example, Volkswagen yesterday debuting their ID7, which is electric vehicle uh, rivaling the likes of Model 3, which is one of the best-selling products in China. And Mercedes-Benz, they are announcing the launch of their uh, new super luxury model of uh, uh, Maybach, which is uh, going to be a fully-fledged uh, electric vehicle priced at $200,000 each. Domestic players are also trying to maintain their lead in the market. BYD, for instance, unveiled its first luxury model called Yang Wan yesterday. It's priced at about 1 million yuan. At the same time, it's seeking to gain market share in the mass market as well. Needless to say, attracting all the car makers to the Chinese market is the rosy growth prospect. Demand is surging. By some estimates, EV sales in China are on track to exceed 8 million units this year from more than 5 million last year. The future of the car industry is EV. Uh, for sure, no question about it. This is Charlie Zhu, Bloomberg News, reporting from Shanghai Auto Show. trillion dollar industry there's a lot of ground to cover we indeed have a rally we're talking a lot of dividends we're talking income we'll show you what's happening in etfs like no one else bloomberg etf iq monday on bloomberg stage is not going to default it never has and it never will even if we do ultimately um, avoid a crisis there's going to be some brink brinkmanship in the lead up to it and that's going to lead to some volatility it matters uh, you know to forward-looking uh, expectations of growth uh, in terms of what uh, is cut we must discuss what we need to cut what we need to protect what new revenue we can raise in the meantime we need to take the threat of default off the tape. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Anna Edwards and Kriti Gupta. It's 10 a.m. in London, 5 a.m. in New York, and 5 p.m. in Hong Kong. Our top stories today. Struggling to avoid a first-ever U.S. default, President Biden and House Speaker Kevin McCarthy don't resolve the impasse over the debt limit, but say they'll meet again on Friday. The new U.S. inflation figure may give insight into what the Fed will do with interest rates. The Consumer Price Index data is out at 8.30 New York time. Shares of the French bank Credit Agricole are surging. Its investment bank posted a record performance in the first quarter. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Chrissy Gupta over in New York. And Chrissy, we've had some decent earnings stories, particularly from the banking sector and the auto suppliers today. But that's not enough to hold up sentiment, which does seem to increasingly be damaged by what's going on with the uh, debt ceiling in the U.S. It absolutely does. As we have a stalemate in Washington, Anna, we have a stalemate in markets as well, at least on the macro front. If you take a look at what futures are actually doing right now, it's a whole lot of nothing, Anna. And that's really exciting to be able to say because it's only down one-tenth of one percent. Does that change, though, as we start to get more headlines coming out of Washington? Remember, President Biden and Speaker McCarthy did speak yesterday to no avail. And that, of course, is having an impact on the Treasury market more substantially than the stock market. The two-year yield starting to tick higher and higher. The inflationary risk that comes off an increase of the debt ceiling is really interesting and really complex in a arena where the Federal Reserve is looking to potentially have its last hike in the rear view mirror 405 nevertheless on the two-year yield really staying above that key four percent level let's see if it stays there though as we get the developments coming out of Washington as those yields tick higher the dollar does too but only marginally I would even call this a uh, much more than one tenth of one percent of a move Anna and it really speaks to that idea that there is more going on abroad interest rate differentials really kicking in here as we have both the ECB 
still looking to be relatively hawkish to the Federal Reserve, as well as some of the other emerging banks around the world. So there is a built-in bear case for the dollar, unless you are worried, of course, about uh, the debt ceiling limit and that simply getting triggered, in which case the dollar seems like a fairly good bet. The bears and the bulls really pulling uh, in either direction there. NYMEX crude, of course, is on recessionary watch. If we talk about the R word, if we're worried about some sort of dramatic drop in the economy, Anna, this is where it's going to show up. 72 handle on NYMEX crude. No red flags yet, but who knows what's to come. Yeah, I've heard different views on the on the dollar and the debt ceiling, Chrissy. Could it be anything like a haven if the source of the concern is around the United States? That's certainly a conversation we'll have uh, with guests as we carry on these conversations. Let's have a look at what we've got here in uh, Europe then, Chrissy. And a negative picture, really, for European stocks. Stocks under pressure, down by two-tenths of one percent on all of the three major biggest markets here in Europe. The FTSE uh, down, the DAX down, the CAC down, all around two-tenths of one percent. As I say, we've had some earnings stories that have lifted sentiment, but not everywhere. We had some uh, disappointing numbers out of ASOS, an online retailer in the clothing space, and that's weighing on the retail sector. Other names in the retail sector, then picking up on that negative vibe, and that sector down by nine-tenths of one percent, one of the worst performing uh, sectors here in Europe today. Credit Agricole, very much to the upside, though. The French uh, bank up by 5.4 percent. Thick trading over at Credit Agricole up by 42 percent in the first quarter of this year. Standout performance from them, and from what they were saying, could that be sustainable into other quarters? We'll get some further analysis on that a little bit later. J.D. Weatherspoons, the uh, pub operator here in the UK. Now, apparently, there wasn't much drinking going on during, actually, the service of the uh, or the ceremony uh, around the King's coronation. But you might have noticed we've had a lot of public holidays in the UK recently, and they've all been doing pretty well in terms of uh, drawing people to the pub. And so uh, that stock goes higher on its update today. And to Critty's point there about what's going on with the euro dollar, I put out uh, that one, 109.53. We heard from Joachim Nagel at the Bundesbank earlier on today, not known to be uh, any, anything on the Darvish side particularly. And he was certainly saying that we uh, might be nearing the end when it comes comes to rate hikes, which I guess ties in with market thinking, Critty, of a couple more rate hikes from the ECB, even if the Fed has paused. But interesting to see him giving that uh, analysis, even though he does acknowledge there is further to go in terms of interest rate hikes. Yeah, and it comes to the markets as well. It looks like markets and uh, the former uh, the ECB officials on the same page there, Anna. That isn't necessarily something you can say is going on stateside. Also seeing a little bit of a split over in Washington between President Biden and congressional Republicans making a little progress towards averting a first ever U.S. default. They did, however, agree on another meeting Friday, which would again include House Speaker Kevin McCarthy. McCarthy spoke yesterday after the meeting. Everybody in this meeting reiterated the positions they were at. I didn't see any new movement. The president said the staff should get back together, but I was very clear with the president. We have now just two weeks to go. The staff will get together and we'll get back together the principals on Friday. Jack Fitzpatrick, Bloomberg government reporter, joins us now in Washington for more. Jack, you heard it right there. Kevin McCarthy saying the clock is ticking. How much progress can even be made on this Friday meeting? They can make progress, and they even said that staff are going to be meeting, uh, they said potentially last night or at least today. Um, there's a, almost a little bit of a disagreement as to whether they're really talking about the debt limit, though, which shows you that the, uh, how, how far apart the two sides are. Uh, Republicans said we are going to meet Friday. Democrats said yes, but we should be having these conversations about spending through the normal congressional budget process. Uh, we're going to have the conversation about where we might agree and disagree on spending through that lens, not actually agreeing that this is about tying that into the debt limit. Um, so it, there's there's still a lot of work to do, essentially, to persuade President Biden that he needs to give some concessions and that he's not going to get a clean debt ceiling increase. Uh, so they can talk about the details of the congressional budget process, but that fundamental first step of agreeing that they need to meet in the middle on a debt ceiling bill really has not fully been reached. Uh, and until they get uh, that uh, agreement to at least negotiate, uh, they're, they're in a very tough spot. Good morning to you, Jack. How do you tie in the comments that we hear from, for example, senior Republicans uh, underlining that the U.S. has never defaulted on its debts and, in the words of some, will never default on its debts? How do you tie that into the standoff that we're seeing at this moment? Because the, the, the market seems nervous that we could go in that direction. Yeah, you generally hear that uh, from members, uh, even at, in, at the height of a debt limit fight, that there's not going to be a default, that they will strike a deal. They don't want to induce panic in the markets. 
uh, even though some level of nervousness might give Washington the 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 uh, I guess the pressure it needs to sincerely start negotiating. There was a bit of a difference between the tone uh, that came from Senator McConnell and Speaker McCarthy. Uh, Senator McConnell said a couple times we're not going to default. McCarthy didn't say we are going to default, but kind of attempted to lay the blame for this late standoff on the president and said that he's done everything he can as House Speaker and he's not in charge of the, the Senate or the presidency. Uh, so that you're going to hear leaders probably say there's not going to be a default, but there's also simultaneously a fight to cast blame uh, if if there were to be a default or if there were to be some panic in the markets as they get closer to the deadline. Yeah, Jack, a lot going on in Washington for sure. But in addition to those debt talks, we, of course, are getting inflation data coming out uh, in just over three hours, 8.30 a.m. New York time. What's the thinking in Washington around the inflationary story as Wall Street starts to talk about the recessionary story? Uh, on inflation, you know, Washington it, it can only accomplish so much this year in a divided government. So a lot of the inflation conversation is through the lens of a debt limit fight and through government spending and what they can do with the, the congressional budget process, even though that's a, a fairly small part, part of federal spending outside of your Social Security and Medicare. Uh, they're not talking about major legislative pushes uh, in the vein of what Democrats tried to do on the supply side with the chips bill that they did and that kind of thing. Um, but really, it has funneled its way into a fight over how much to reduce discretionary federal spending, uh, which may not be the absolute crux of the inflation issue, uh, but certainly ties into it. Uh, so there, there's sort of limited um, opportunities for lawmakers to respond and engage to the, the numbers that come out. And it's kind of turned into a political fight that really folds into this debt limit fight and government spending. Jack, thanks so much. Jack Fitzpatrick up early for us from Bloomberg Government to take us through the latest on the debt ceiling and the debates that continue there. Uh, back to the UK story, and wages are rising fast and finally catching up to inflation. Pay rose 10% in the past year for those taking new jobs, crucially. Uh, this, according to data that's been analysed by Bloomberg. UK economics reporter Lucy White joins us now with analysis. Lucy, and it is important to point this out, this isn't the uh, overall wage numbers from the UK economy. This is specifically around those who are changing jobs isn't it? But what does this mean for the Bank of England as it attempts to get inflation then under control? As you say, it's, it's a pretty huge number. Um, it's much bigger than the 6.3% uh, rise in median pay that we've seen across the whole economy. And it suggests that for those who are taking new jobs, um, this is, you know, the wages attached to job adverts, um, the, they are, so many are seeing um, wage rises that are in line with inflation. And since this is the median number, many who are perhaps even seeing wage rises that are above inflation. So as the Bank of England, you know, uh, we go into the next monetary policy meeting tomorrow, um, as the Bank of England tries to get, you know, inflation under control with this unprecedented string of rate hikes that we've seen, it perhaps m makes the case for more rate hikes mm. over the next few months. Mm. Lucy, let's connect the economics with the politics here. What does this translate to when it comes to the Conservatives' leveling up plan? It's interesting in that, you know, some of the regions where their pay is highest um, are the big cities. So it's London, Manchester, Cambridge, which is obviously um, a real biotech hotspot at the moment. Um, so there is a, a fair bit of rebalancing to be done if we want to see uh, real pay growth outside of those regions. But there are some early signs uh, that that is happening. It's areas such as Blackpool, Huddersfield, Birkenhead, some of these lesser known towns that have perhaps not seen quite as much attention over the last few years um, that are seeing pay rise at some of the fastest paces. And part of this is um, you know, a, a factor of the shortages that we've been seeing in the economy. So it's sectors such as education, medicine, social care um, that are really driving pay in these areas. And um, as James Reid, the chief executive of, of Reid Recruitment, pointed out to me, um, you know, if we want to future-proof the economy, we really need to be investing in uh, the tech jobs, um, the tech education in some of the more deprived areas of the UK okay. that are really going to push us forward. Lucy, thanks very much. Thanks for bringing us the analysis. Uh, Lucy White there with the uh, details of that uh, uh, Bloomberg UK uh, jobs report. Now back to the corporate earnings stories and Credit Agricole's investment bank posted a record performance in the first quarter, beating larger rivals. The French lenders' debt traders powered a surge in revenue. I spoke with the deputy CEO, Jérôme Grivet, earlier. 
uh, again, we've been able to capture uh, a lot of customer opportunities. We haven't been taking any additional risks, and indeed, the value at risk, for example, that we posted for this quarter was slightly decreasing as compared to the previous quarter. Uh, but definitely, our teams are able to seize opportunities uh, towards our customers and to be relevant in their commercial proposal that they are able to make to the clients. So definitely, this proves that we are able to be here towards our customer and to propose the relevant solution, be it in debt capital market or hedging products. Joining us now from Paris is Bloomberg Finance reporter Alex Rajbandari. Alex, great to have you with us. So uh, what drove this really strong performance then at Credit Agricole? And crucially, we were trying to get there in our questioning to, to whether this is sustainable. Yes, so the bank benefited from a recovery in primary debt markets early in the quarter and then on the volatility around the uncertainty um, around the trajectory of interest rates throughout the quarter. So, and clients needed to hedge that risk and turn to, to credit I could call for that. Um, the thing is, so it's good news for investors, shares climbed this morning uh, with uh, that news, but it's not going to be sustainable. The executives have said that uh, they don't expect this to be repeated in the second quarter because volatility has eased and uh, clients needs for hedging have decreased as well. But still, they did say that they expect the quarter, the, uh, performance of the fixed income trading units to be quite good and uh, in line with their budget and uh, provisions for the year. And net income more than doubling from a year ago. Is this purely a function of just higher rates? How do you go about explaining that? So it's, um, it's a mix of different factors. Um, the first one is provisions. They fell nearly 50% from last year, but you need to bear in mind that last year they were inflated because of Russia-related charges. Um, so it's quite, it's, it's quite good news, but it's, it's because there was a, a high effect from last year. Then for net interest income, as you say, interest rates, the bank has not gained so much on interest rates so far because French retail banking is not getting the full benefit of high interest rates because of high cost of funding linked to regulated savings. However, when you look at the bank's units abroad and the international retail units, Revenues have been rising 23% over the quarter, so that's quite, that quite shows how uh, benefit, beneficial it can be for banks uh, to have higher interest rates today. Alex, thanks very much for the update. Uh, Alex Rajbandari joining us there in Paris. Coming up, Sylvia Ardania joins us. Barclays' chief European economist will uh, work our way towards the CPI data out of the United States later on today and also the Bank of England rate decision. That's coming up tomorrow. And tomorrow we will have an exclusive interview with the JP Morgan CEO, Jamie Dimon, live from the bank's annual global markets conference that takes place in Paris. Look for that interview at 8.15 New York time. That's tomorrow, 1.15 p.m. in London. And this is Blink Bank. standing presence here in, in Houston for the past, I would say, 20-some years mm -hmm. since the compact merger. We bought a piece of land, we started building this building. And um, in doing so, we had to also recalibrate how we were building it because the pandemic hit us. And we thought about recreating a work environment that is very, very different, that is catered for this new structural way of working, which we call Edge to Office where people don't always come to the office to work, can work remotely from their homes, their edges, but have to come back to the office for specific reasons, such as uh, team meetings, customer meetings, and in general, collaboration. With regards to the hybrid work model, do you see that some, as, as something that will persist longer term when the pandemic is long gone? Yes, no question, this will persist. Studios.
studios in New York and San Francisco. Our expert hosts have the data and analysis about the companies you know and the startups to watch. Plus, the interviews you don't want to miss. Watch Caroline Hyde and Ed Ludlow on Bloomberg Technology, the only daily business show dedicated to tech right in the middle of the trading action. 12 p.m. on the East Coast, 9 a.m. in the West, only on Bloomberg Television, your global business authority. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Kriti Gupta in New York with Anna Edwards in London. Look, all the talk this week is likely going to be around the debt ceiling debate. We were supposed to have that meeting yesterday. We did to no avail. Another meeting coming in on Friday. Now, from the macro front, the markets look like they're in a stalemate, just the way that Washington is. But there is some movement in certain securities. And this is what brings me to uh, the chart this morning. For our radio audience, stick with me here. We are looking at a chart that goes all the way back to 2012, a 10-year chart of one-month T bill yield. So this is really important because as we are talking about the security considered to be one of the most risk-free securities backed by the full faith and credit of the United States government, people are dumping them. Investors are getting out of it because of that fear that is starting to ramp up as we get closer and closer to that early June deadline. And now it's gotten to a point that those yields are skyrocketing even higher than they did going all the way back to the 2006-2007 global financial crisis where you did see yields skyrocket to about 5.24%. Now they're crossing even that. It really speaks again to the worry you are seeing in this market and perhaps a little bit of hedging as people really measure their exposure to the debt ceiling debate. Joining us now for a little bit more perspective, Donna L. Batalji, Bloomberg Managing Editor for Credit. Walk us through just how sustainable this trade really is. How much is the market overreacting uh, relative to the few uh, iterations we've had of this saga in the past? I think there have been quite a few voices out there over the last week that basically said that this might be one of the best buying opportunities for anyone that has a more sobering view about whether or not the U.S. will default. I think quite a few people have already said that they think that the prospect of a default is very, very slim. And so what we're looking at is this opportunity to make a ton of money on this trade, not just those securities, but you're also looking at the CDS market that has also blown out. There just seems to be a bit of a dislocation here. Mm. And, and bear in mind, this is not the first time that we've been here. We have been very close to a deadline, and but somehow they come to an agreement and everything calms down again. Yes, you feel like you've been here before and again and again, Dana. Exactly. We've certainly seen this, this movie a few times. Uh, in terms of, you mentioned the, uh, the the CDS market, the cost of insuring against default here. And some people say, you know, that, that there's not much liquidity at, at certain tenors in this particular market and mm -hmm. also point to the fact that um, really, even if you see these rates go a lot higher, they're still relatively low. But actually, maybe the latter of those in question now, because it, to some in some areas, as we're seeing US CDS price above some emerging markets, which is quite incredible when you think this is supposed to be the definition of the risk free rate. That's exactly why, for some people, this is an amazing buying opportunity. When was the last time you saw US CDS is this high? At the end of the day, at 180 or whatever it is that the contracts are trading at right now, that is an amazing price for a country like the US. At the end of the day, as we know, there's a massive chance that they will come to an ag agreement. Those contracts will become a lot more palatable. People will make a ton of money. I think by you know the first few days of June, this story will die down, and then we will move on. Well, let us see. Let us see. Yeah, we spoke to some guests yesterday who actually had some quite high percentage chances attached to the threat of default. So we'll see what comes to pass. But Dana, thank you very much uh, for joining us. Bloomberg's Dana Elbertaji joining us there with the latest on credit markets. For more market analysis, check out MLIV Go on the Bloomberg terminal. That's where you'll find the Markets Live blog. This is Bloomberg.
Business Week Radio, live weekday afternoons at 3 p.m. Eastern. We got a little bit of talk. But are you guys ready? Harnessing the power of Bloomberg Business Week, Carol Masser and Tim Stanovac bring you the latest news from the worlds of business, technology, politics, and more. How does the Fed play into this and what the Fed does potentially? This is so exhausting and this is so all-encompassing. Listen on Bloomberg Radio and streaming on YouTube and Bloomberg Originals. The top names in climate change are on Bloomberg. I want everybody committed to the kind of action that we need. We have a global emergency now. You know, we're still putting 162 million tons of man-made global warming pollution into the sky every day, using the sky as an open sewer. That's trapping as much extra heat as would be released by 600,000 Hiroshima-class atomic bombs exploding every day. That's what the scientists tell us, and it, the data shows it. That's crazy. That's why we have a third of Pakistan underwater. That's why we have the historic heat wave in China. Nothing comparable to that ever. That's why uh, the heat records are broken every year. And we're seeing in, an increase in the flows of climate refugees crossing international borders th that are due to vastly expand unless we take action to solve the climate crisis. Nobody covers climate change like Bloomberg, your global business authority. Welcome back to Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. Good morning, good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. Welcome to Bloomberg Markets trying to open... This is Bloomberg Technology. And welcome to Balance of Power. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg UK, your source for news and analysis covering the biggest challenges facing the UK government, economy, financial services, and markets. Tax cuts should not be the priority. It's about a credible plan for growth over the next two, three years. In this post-Brexit world, how do you see actually servicing your clients? It was disruptive, and it's going to have implications to how capital raising works. Now we're having the perfect storm in the UK. Watch Francine Lacqua Thursdays at 9.30 a.m. only on Bloomberg, your global business authority. Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Kriti Gupta in New York with Anna Edwards in London. Now keeping you up to date with news from around the world, here's the first word. A surprise move in China, a little-known local government official has been named the top regulator overseeing the $61 trillion financial sector. Former banker Li Yunzi will be party secretary of the newly formed National Financial Supervision and Management Bureau. The agency regulates thousands of banks, insurers, and trust firms. Bloomberg's learned New York Republican Congressman George Santos has been indicted on federal charges. He had been under investigation over possible campaign finance violations. Santos took office despite fabricating much of what he had claimed about his education and career. Former President Trump plans to appeal after a jury in New York found him liable for sexually assaulting a woman and then defaming her. It's the first verdict against him in a string of legal cases that threatened to erupt during the presidential campaign. The jury also ordered the former president to pay the woman, E. Jean Carroll, $5 million in damages. Jurors stopped short of finding him liable for rape. And Tucker Carlson will start a show on Twitter after being fired by Fox News. In a video posted on the social media platform, Carlson said he would be out with a new version of the show he'd done on Fox starting soon. Carlson was fired last month after Fox settled a defamation suit with Dominion Voting Systems for more than $787 million. Very interesting ahead of the political cycle, Anna. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, coming up on the program, we'll get back to the macro themes, though. Sylvia Ardania joins us, Barclays' chief European economist. Uh, we will talk about U.S. CPI. This is Bloomberg.
beliefs. We're not going to be relying upon countries whose values we don't share. To the world of business. It's all about corporate power of the end. Balance of Power, live from Bloomberg's Washington headquarters. We couldn't be more excited what's in store for you. How long will it take? How many years? Why don't we take this one day at a time? Good luck. Everybody has a perspective. Every weekday at 5 p.m. Eastern time, join hosts Anne-Marie Hordern. It's the one area, really, of bipartisanship. Well, I think we're getting more of it. That's an optimistic. And Joe Matthew. The debt ceiling is looming. How close are we going to get to the line before you start to worry? Alongside Kaylee Lyons. The door was open for regulators to do more. And that puts the Fed between a rock and a hard place. As they deliver news. This is such an important economic issue. He's no longer trying to run away from that. That really blew some minds. Insight. We can both invest in law enforcement and also make sure that communities feel safe in their own skin. And analysis. I think your audience will get this more than most. It's not the Republican Party that you know. It allows him to do what he did so successfully in 2020 which is run against crazy from and about politics biggest power players this was the zombie case and it's now more than well alive that's for sure uh, with two more potentially to come i'm willing to have this battle it is vitally important this is the intersection of washington and wall street bringing people directly to the decision makers right. that impact your investments and your life balance of power every weekday at 5 p.m eastern only on bloomberg your global business authority London, Sydney, from Washington, Tokyo. 9 a.m. in Beijing and Shanghai. Good morning, everyone. Have a great evening. Here's what I'm watching. You do not want to miss this story. He's there to kind of upside. I think that it's hard to put your head around any narrative. Let's just be honest. We've had sort of a shift in, are we in some sort of stagflation fears moment? People were talking about that all day yesterday. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. Here's what you need to know. Struggling to avoid a first ever U.S. default, President Biden and House Speaker Kevin McCarthy don't resolve the impasse over the debt limit. They say they'll meet again Friday. The new U.S. inflation figure may give insight on what the Federal Reserve will do next with interest rates. The Consumer Price Index out at 8.30 a.m. New York time. And across the Atlantic, shares of French bank Credit Agricole are surging. Its investment bank posted a record performance in the first quarter. I'm Kriti Gupta in New York with Anna Edwards in London. Anna, you know, we're talking about all these macro stories, all these stalemates in Washington. I think often the market forgets underneath the hood, record performance from companies on both sides of the Atlantic are still very much in play. Yeah, absolutely. We've uh, we've seen some decent performance, certainly coming through from the banking sector here in Europe. Critty, that plays in. But overall, European equity markets are under pressure, maybe off earlier lows, but down by two-tenths of one percent as we wait for that CPI data out from the U.S. later that you mentioned in the headlines. Credit Agricole is one of those businesses where we've seen uh, the numbers uh, delighting investors, if you like, up by 5.8 percent. A bit diff difficult for analysts to compare with last time due to some changes in accounting rules. But in terms of the numbers, the fit performance, a 42 percent increase in revenue revenue from that part of their business, certainly going down well with the investment community. J.D. Weatherspoons, then, this is a pub business in the UK, up by 4.9% today. Uh, they have talked positively about the degree to which uh, Brits are perhaps making the most of all of the bank holidays, all of the public holidays we get through the month of May, and that's been going pretty well, of course, for a pub operating business. Uh, the euro is at 109.55, pretty unmoved this morning. It's been caught in that range of around 109, 110 for quite some time, Chrissy. But interesting to think that we heard from uh, Joachim Nagel today uh, giving us the sort of party line that there's uh, uh, the, the, the still more hiking to come, and that's what we heard from the ECB last week. They're not on pause, so we are still expected, and Christine Lagarde reiterating that today as well. But he did also suggest that maybe we are getting closer to, to, to where they need to be in terms of restrictive territory, uh, suggesting that there's not so much further for the ECB to go in terms of hiking rates, Critty. Yeah, and something that the market is very much pricing in, you're not seeing the same divide uh, that you are seeing perhaps stateside, especially when it comes to the read-through, Anna, that you're seeing in something like yield and the dollar, which brings me right to today's market action. The two-year yield at 404 right now, sustainably above that 4% level, but again, kind of at the whim of not just the debt ceiling debates, but the Federal Reserve and arguably what the ECB does across the Atlantic. It's certainly a dynamic, to your point, Anna, that's affecting the dollar as, of course, euro dollar stays uh, stagnant as well, about unchanged on the Bloomberg dollar index right now. And unchanged in a range, those are the terms I would use to describe the S&P 500 as well. Futures only down one-tenth of 1% in a stalemate similar to the 
congressional situation in Washington. Even as we are on inflationary watch, those CPI numbers coming out in about three hours or so, and recessionary watch. NYMEX crude still our gauge for that trading at about a 72 handle. So on the macro front, it does seem a little kind of frozen in time, Anna. But look, there is movement underneath the hood, especially when it comes to those debt ceiling talks. It's a really big part of the story, simply about how the market participants are really positioning for that, specifically hedging for that. Now, here's a chart that I'm going to show you for our radio audience. Stick with me. We're basically looking at credit default swap prices, essentially how much it costs to insure against the default of the United States government. We're going to a chart all the way back to 2008. We know we've had several reiterations of this debt ceiling debate and several spikes in those costs to insure to kind of match that. But no spike as large as this one that really crosses over 150 basis points when you look at the swap price. This is really important because on the surface, it looks like this is a massive move. But keep in mind, the one-year CDS market for the U.S. debt is not as liquid and certainly not as big as it used to be in those previous iterations. So even though on the chart, it looks like a magnified move, Anna, perhaps not so much underneath the hood. Mm, yeah, really interesting. The debt ceiling certainly does dominate the conversation. It continues that conversation as investors await a key U.S. inflation report for insights on the path of the Federal Reserve's rate hikes. Uh, joining us now is Sylvia Ardania, Barclays' chief European economist. And Sylvia, there's a lot to talk about this morning. We'll get to the Bank of England, which of course is due to give its uh, rate decision uh, shortly. Well, that comes on Thursday. We'll get to that part of the conversation shortly. Let me start, though, with the U.S. CPI picture, because, of course, global fights against inflation is still very topical. And and uh, the U.S. piece of data is due out today. What's going to matter to you when you watch this, uh, this really crucial bit of U.S. data drop? Good morning, Anna. Well, three things have, three parts of the report will obviously matter to us. We have the headline numbers, and here we expect an increase on the month on month by 0.38, which leaves the annual uh, level of inflation at 5%. It is the core print, which we think it will be just a touchdown relative to what it was a month before. We expect on the monthly increase 0.34 with a 5.5% year on year rate. But most importantly, Importantly, it is the composition behind the core print. And here, what we think, what we expect is that we will see some slowing in the service costs, but that will be partial, it will be offset by higher goods prices. And the higher goods prices is particularly related to the price of used cars. But I think what's important to, to see is uh, some, you know, uh, evidence of some deceleration in inflation in the service components. And we expect that to happen in uh, many different categories from transport of services to, um, you know, the, the, the shelter component will be important that we think it will be a bit more, you know, uh, resilient. Well, I'm glad you mentioned the shelter part. Good morning, Sylvia. Uh, I want to ask you about how quickly that deceleration is really going to catch up to perhaps the commodities-driven inflation that we've seen in the last year or so come down. Why is shelter taking slow, so long to decelerate? Well, that's that's a good question. We see some evidence in the private data where we see, uh, you know, some uh, in in Brent, we we start seeing some deceleration. It's coming, you know, with some delay in the BLS um, data, uh, which looks at the average, not just the new uh, rents. So we expect some of that to beginning to appear, you know, this month or or you know in the next um, couple of months going. Uh, but then we expect, you know, in other categories, you know, a faster deceleration. I think I think it has a lot to do also with demand and with the fact that the U.S. economy uh, is uh, slowing but is uh, remaining still quite resilient. We have seen a pretty strong GDP print in terms of domestic demand components. The labor market remains pretty strong. So there is, uh, you know, the, the economy is still uh, doing quite well. And that gives uh, pricing power to, um, uh, to firms, to, to households who rent apartments and so on. Uh, Sylvia, I want to get your thoughts on the Bank of England. And let's just listen to an earlier conversation on Bloomberg Television where we spoke to Sushil uh, Wadwani of PGM Wadwani. And he, he advises the current chancellor, formerly worked at the Bank of England. Let's listen to how he's approaching tomorrow's decision from the BOE. You don't want this fast headline inflation to become entrenched in expectations. So that, I think, explains why the Bank of England has, has been tightening meaningfully, we are now again at a very tricky point 
in the interest rate tightening cycle because we clearly also uh, wish to avoid over tightening. Uh, the consensus expects a 25 beep hike this week. Uh, that seems about right. But I think from here on, they do need to tread carefully. So Shil Wadwani there. So he says, Sylvia, then, that from here on, after the 25, they need to tread carefully. What does treading carefully look like for the Bank of England? We also have an additional 25 basis points hike after this week one. So we think that the bank rate terminal will be 475. But uh, we think that in terms of communications, the bank will keep its options open, which uh, means that they will not commit to any additional hike. They will look at the data. Potentially, there is the risk that they could skip the June meeting and hike in August. So I think the my interpretations of tread it carefully is really to, um, you know, acknowledge the fact that uh, quite a significant amount of tightening has been done since the cycle began. Rates are in restrictive territory, and we know that monetary policy acts with lags. So potentially, um, the real effect of these hikes is still uh, to come. And, and so for this reason, the Bank of England will remain, uh, you know, quite, quite open-minded and will try to trade off the the two, uh, the risk that the two was basically said that these increasing prices can be entrenched in expectations versus the risk of over tightening and, and generating a two, um, an excessive slowdown in economic activity and, and a decline in inflation below targets at the relevant policy horizons, which is, you know, two, three years down the road. So, Sylvia, square that then with what we're hearing out of the ECB and arguably the Federal Reserve as well. As the Federal Reserve talks about perhaps not hiking at all or hiking more over the summer, the ECB, uh, as Anna pointed out earlier, making it quite clear that their last hikes might just happen this summer as well. Will the BOE continue to hike into the end of the year? Is that idea of coming to the end of the rate tightening cycle limited to the U.S. and the ECB alone? No, in our own baseline, we also think that the BOE will come to the end of the tightening cycle before the summer. We have uh, the last rate hike as a baseline case happening in June. We see the risk of that being postponed to August. So the idea that there can be a hike in when the, the bank releases the monetary policy report is something that we don't rule it out. But again, uh, we would think that the Bank of England will join the Fed and the ECB and end the, the tightening cycle by the summer. Sylvia, thank you very much. Thanks for joining us. Sylvia Ardania of Barclays talking us through expectations around US CPI and the Bank of England. Coming up on the program, back to earnings stories. Disney is out with results after the bell this uh, today. More on what to expect from the entertainment giant next. This is Big Bang. so intimately linked to the future of the UK. What are you seeing when you go to branches and in the country? Yeah, we're seeing a lot of anxiety at the moment. Um, you know, I think the recovery from the pandemic has been and is continuing to be very strong. So I, I think we're seeing the economy recover. But with rising interest rates, with inflation, those, those are things that you know, peoples and families and businesses haven't had to deal with for 10 years. So a lot of business owners today haven't had to operate in that environment. So it co is causing quite a lot of anxiety, which means, you know, it, it, for us, because we're up and down the country in branches and offices, we can spend a lot of time talking to businesses and helping them plan and deal with it. But it is, you know, it's very different and it's not something people have had to operate in for a long time.
Welcome to the world of decentralized finance. You can see the massive gains for the OG crypto coin. The breakout we have all perhaps long awaited finally realized. We'll see if it sticks. Bloomberg's covering all things crypto. The people. There's no question this industry is composed of some bad actors and some good actors. The transactions. Volumes have surpassed $24 billion per day. And the technology. Stop talking about the technology. Start demonstrating the utility. Bloomberg Crypto, Tuesdays. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Kriti Gupta in New York with Anna Edwards in London. A critical earnings report coming after the bell today for Disney CEO Bob Iger. It's the first full quarter since his return in November. Joining us now to discuss is Geetha Ranganathan, Bloomberg Intelligence U.S. media analyst who was kind enough to wake up early for what's going to be a pretty important day uh, for, for both you and for Disney alike. Geetha, walk us through the significance of Bob Iger's impact in the first quarter here. What kind of difference could he make? Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Kriti and Anna, for having me. So I think it's all about cost cutting. Uh, that's really what it's come down to, because the buzzword right now in the media industry is really all about streaming profitability. And remember, when Bob Iger came back to the company last November, he really outlined his strategy. I mean, there is a lot of uh, realignment in terms of uh, creative uh, prowess. There is a lot of financial realignment. But, but, but obviously, the biggest announcement that he made was this $5.5 billion in cost cutting uh, and it's, uh, you know, and I think what we're really looking to see is have they made significant progress on that front? Because he kind of came out with all guns, uh, all guns blazing. He had his whole strategic vision kind of outlined. Now we have to see whether he's really been able to execute. Well, it's interesting that you talk about cost cutting specifically and perhaps jobs that are on the line. As at the same time, Disney is also dealing with its own fight in Florida uh, with Governor Ron DeSantis at the moment. Walk us through how that might reflect into their earnings story. Yeah, so that, Kriti, uh, is a lot of headline risk, and I think that is going to be an extended battle, but it's really more, you know, about the politics of it. I don't necessarily see any of that kind of affecting the bottom line, and we think this is going to be really an extended battle, maybe going out for the next two to three years, and it, it, I don't think it necessarily gets into any kind of legal settlement. I think it's all just going to be more uh, political. But as far as we see the parks business, the parks is really turning out to be the crown jewel of the Disney empire. So believe it or not, this year, parks will be responsible for 75% of profits for the entire company. And they've really been punching above their weight. So this whole post-pandemic new normal for the parks uh, has just been phenomenal. I mean, if we look at it in terms of profitability, if we look at it in terms of per capita spending, margins, uh, they have really been going gangbusters. And this whole talk about, you know, a, a slowing in consumer spending or, you know, a, the possibility of a recession, somehow we are just not seeing that in the numbers. So again, when they report today, we're expecting about $2.1 billion in operating income for the parks. That's over a 20% increase in profits. So parks doing really, mm. really well. Yeah, some real incredible resilience in some of those resent, uh, revenge consumption activities, Geetha, uh, post the pandemic, I suppose. Uh, you talk about lower streaming losses and how that's going to be a real focus for the markets. For businesses such as Disney, Geetha, how do they go about getting to those lower losses around streaming? What, what are the levers that they pull? Yeah, so, you know, thankfully now, the you know, the whole media ecosystem, as well as Disney, has kind of... Uh, shied away from, you know, going after subscribers at all costs. I mean, they were doing that for the longest period of time. They've ramped up about 160 million subscribers. But now it's all about cost rationalization. So there's $3 billion in content costs that they're looking to trim. Uh, there's $2.5 billion in non-content costs. Uh, and remember, Disney is a company that lost $4 billion in its streaming business just last year. But they are looking to kind of trim that pretty significantly uh, going forward. So this period, we're actually looking... So, la so last quarter, they actually lost a billion dollars in their streaming business. They're planning to... Those those losses should moderate to about $850 million this quarter. And then we are going to look for signs in, you know... Uh, those those uh, losses getting better and better. And remember, not only are they undertaking content cost rationalization, but we're also seeing them do a lot of things to boost the top line. So whether it's implementing price increases, whether it's having a new Disney Plus advertising tier. So a combination of those two, I think, will definitely lead to an inflection in the profitability curve uh, later this year.
Mm, yeah, tiering of uh, pricing strategies and the resilience of their pricing power, really interesting to watch. Geetha, what about other brands, ESPN, Hulu, uh, uh, these areas of, of business? Yeah, so those are really the two big question marks, Anna, ESPN and Hulu. What is the strategic direction for those two assets? So we know with Hulu, um, you know, it, it's kind of uh, two-thirds owned by Disney, one-third owned by Comcast. They do have this all-important date, Jan of 2024, when they need to kind of make a decision whether they're going to keep the asset or they're going to, you know, sell it to Comcast. So we, we still are, it's, what Bob Iger has said, uh, has kind of raised more questions than answers. So he's kind of said that all options are on the table. So again, I think that is going to come up in the earnings call today we have to see what they're deciding to do with that asset and then espn you bring up a really interesting point because this is the first time that they're going to be actually breaking espn into its own segment remember this was the crown jewel in the disney portfolio but obviously with all the cord cutting with all of the you know secular declines in the tv ecosystem again we're kind of looking for some strategic direction here again this is an important asset it generates about four billion dollars in profits every year but they have to be really careful about the messaging, okay? So if they're going to go deeper into, uh, you know, a direct-to-consumer solution, it has to be incremental, not cannibalistic. So again, we're looking to see what exactly they're planning to do with this asset going forward. A lot of balls in the air, of course, as Disney juggles uh, their earnings narrative after the bell today. Geetha Ranganathan of Bloomberg Intelligence, we thank you as always. As we wait those earnings after the bell, a quick check on those shares, though. They are higher by about one-tenth of one percent, though. And on the surface, it doesn't look very significant. But in a background where the rest of the market is trading lower on both sides of the Atlantic, that is actually a positive result, something we're going to keep an eye on throughout the day as, of course, we wait for the earnings after the bell. Some other stocks that we're watching, of course, Airbnb at the top of that list as well. Those shares down about 13% in the pre-market. They're talking about cracks in their travel demand. The outlook that a lot of companies are saying is still positive, the consumer is still spending. Well, Airbnb does not share that message and really getting punished for it in the pre-market. They're down about 13%. The other stock we want to watch, Occidental, buying back 6.5% of Warren Buffett's preferred stock. Remember the story that Warren Buffett not only helped finance the Anadarko deal a couple of years ago, but he's been kind of buying more and more shares. Uh, some speculation over the weekend that he was going to try to take over Occidental in some capacity, Anna. He said, no, we're not going to do that. But Occidental uh, is redeeming those preferred stock and in doing so, losing a little bit of cash in the process. Those shares down about 1.6% as a result, Anna. Yeah, that was... That was something we learned at the weekend, wasn't it, from the uh, Berkshire Hathaway meetings that took place. Now, Chrissy, coming up on the program, the latest read on U.S. inflation is out in just a few hours' time. We'll take a look at what markets are expecting next. This is Bloomberg. Did art conservation help you in any way to be a better investor? And should a lot of good investors oh. who are, learn how to be an art conservator for, as well or, or not? I think in, conserva in conservation and art history and liberal arts, I think differently than a lot of um, you know people that have just done finance. And also, I think I mentioned one of the things is to do conservation, you have to really do a lot of work, pre-work, before you actually do a treatment. And so a lot of that pre-work is very similar to what I do in due diligence for investments. You know, lots of testing, lots of thinking about what could go wrong, lots of research. You know, I, when I was an art historian, that was in the old days before the internet, but you'd sit in the stacks and you'd pull one thing in a bibliography on this and you'd sort of like a mosaic theory, push, put all these things together. I feel like I do that in my due diligence. to the world of business every weekday at 5 p.m. Eastern.
Eastern Time, hosts Anne-Marie Hordern and Joe Matthew, alongside Kaylee Lines, deliver news, insight, and analysis live from Bloomberg's Washington headquarters. Get the latest from and about politics' biggest power players at the end of every trading day. Balance of Power, every weekday at 5 p.m. Eastern Time, only on Bloomberg, your global business authority. Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Preeti Gupta in New York with Anna Edwards in London. The U.S. CPI print due today at 8.30 a.m. New York time, just under three hours. Joining us now for a preview is Michael McKee, Bloomberg International Economics and Policy Correspondent. Waking up early for us, look, uh, this forecast, we're expecting inflation to come down. It's kind of a foregone conclusion. Does the Fed care about today's numbers? Uh, not so much because there's another CPI report coming up by uh, the end. By the time they get uh, to their next meeting on June 14th, we also get a PCE index uh, inflation report before that as well. But we are expecting some news today that might disappoint the markets who do react to everything right away. And that's because inflation is forecast to come in uh, basically unchanged on the month. We're going to see no change at all in the headline number. Uh, we got some. Uh, energy price issues there. And then the core, uh, just over the last 24 hours, has been revised up to a four-tenths uh, change for the month, which keeps the uh, month over month uh, only a tenth lower. So we're still well above the level that uh, the Fed is looking for, of course, that 2% target. Yes, and so that, to the point, Mike, about whether the Fed cares, I mean, you mentioned that there's more data to come, so they'll get another chance to sort of look at the inflation picture before they have to make any more decisions about rates. But also, as Ben Rahm on the Markets Live blog points out to me this morning, we've had nine months of headline slowing. So I suppose they take comfort from that trend, almost regardless of what today's data shows. Is that, is that the feeling? Well, that is the feeling, and they knew that this would be, as they put it, uh, kind of volatile, that you would have months where things don't go exactly as they planned, but in general, inflation's coming down. Uh, the Cleveland Fed CPI now indicator has uh, always kind of forecast what's going to happen, and it does show a sort of flattening out of inflation over the last couple of months. Uh, looks like, uh, you know, we're going to be stuck in the fives for a while. But what they're counting on is that we're finally going to see some rent reductions start to come through, maybe in the May numbers that we get uh, in June. And that will start us on the process down to the next level, which is closer to 4%. Mike, 30 seconds here. The rent levels you mentioned, the shelter costs. Why are the shelter costs decelerating faster, given that we are now entering or ending the rate tightening cycle? Shouldn't we see a bigger effect? Well, we saw the effect at the beginning of uh, this whole cycle because rents were going up a lot. And it takes a while, about a year, for the declines to start to get into the overall numbers. And we saw declines starting to come during the pandemic. And now they're uh, sort of flattening out to going up again. But we should see the declines that were a year ago in rents show up uh, fairly soon. Yeah, Mike, thanks very much. Really interesting uh, conversation there ahead of the CPI data, Bloomberg's Michael McKee. Interesting, our guest from Barclays earlier on, Chrissy, was talking about core composition being really in focus, slowing services, but good price going higher. That was her assessment of what the core would show, and that would be, of course, in contrast to what we'd seen in previous months where we'd seen goods prices uh, coming down and services being uh, sticky. So a lot to focus on when it comes to the composition of these numbers. That is it for early edition. Surveillance is ahead. They'll be speaking to Peter Oppenheimer of Goldman Sachs, getting views on the equity markets, no doubt. Uh, we'll have plenty more in the run-up to the CPI print later. This is Bloomberg.
York City, a $100,000 salary feels like just $36,000. That's according to a new study that looks at 76 of the largest U.S. cities to see where $100,000 goes the furthest, after taxes and after accounting for the cost of living. For many, reaching a six-figure salary is a huge moment when you feel like you finally made it. But that feeling may not last long when you realize <laughs> just how much taxes and the cost of living in an expensive city takes out of your paycheck. And that's especially true after two years of inflation. Hybrid and remote work have opened up so many more opportunities for people to choose where they live. So that forces the question, should I stick it out in an expensive city or try to find somewhere more affordable? So where should you live if you want to maximize your salary? Consider Memphis, Tennessee. The home of the blues top the list with a take-home pay of about $86,000. Tennessee doesn't have an income tax, and the cost of living there is about 14% cheaper than the national average. So a dollar there takes you much further. Texas is another popular choice, and it's clear why. Seven of the top 10 cities where $100,000 goes the furthest are in Texas, a state known for low taxes. Of course, there are so many factors that influence where you choose to live. You may want to be at the center of things, or be near family, or be somewhere where there are a lot of career opportunities in your field. It's not always just about dollars and cents. Going to keep Rain World Cup. This is a three. As the economic picture done. Is it the okay is getting ready to make this decision? Why do the biggest names in business choose Bloomberg? That is a great question. It's a great question. Great question. Great question. Best question I get all night. Bloomberg. Top experts. Great questions. We have to remember, with rates being higher, it's more costly for people to borrow. Our best guess continues to be that there are some earnings disappointments out there. Part of the reason we have a challenge right now is the equity market is way ahead of itself. It's one of those environments where the market is heavily biased towards pricing in a recession. The consensus right now is expecting a recession to start, really, in this quarter. It just doesn't seem like that's going to happen. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrow, Lisa Abramowitz, and Tom Keen on radio, on television. It's Inflation Wednesday. Bramow's been up all night trying to figure out the vectors of inflation. There's really no other story today, Lisa. There's this, that, the other thing. Farrow's on assignment. The answer is Inflation Wednesday. So we've been worried about the banks. Now we get to worry about the fundamental economy and how much the Fed still has to do at a time when people are still pricing in rate cuts. And I think that's really going to be the focus. Is today the day where they price it out of market expectations simply because inflation is just too steep. You go right to the heart of the matter for me. We're going to be talking about this through the day, and we begin strong with Peter Oppenheimer of Goldman Sachs. So stay with us here for some a lot of different briefs here. It's the inflation vector. And I think if you want rate cuts, the vector has to go down is the game plan. Yeah, well, either the, the, either the vector has to go down or there has to be some sort of crisis. On the banking front, we haven't seen any real signs of a percolating crisis that's ongoing. And on the inflation side, it seems sticky. So something has to give. And why do markets keep pricing in? That It's going to be the crisis side. It's going to be the idea of disinflation. I like what Peter says, talking about neutrality and a neutral call on the market. Mario Gabelli will join us at the top of the 80s o'clock hour widely anticipated you know you know like Farrell reads barons every saturday morning he does he gets He's his what's cup mario of tea doing what's mario doing what's, what's mario doing and how many people are going to have to talk about the debt ceiling as well as the, you know what's going on really you think so they kind of have to at a certain yeah. point because there's been stasis, and that's what all of the reports have been reading ab are about because the inflation vectors, people are saying, are sticky, you, period, full stop. Do you think after the coronation, the king of England kicks the can down the road? <laughs> I mean, is that what we're going to see in the debt ceiling? And that's what they do think, in the United you think, Kingdom, right? You think right? there's like a royal debt the ceiling? royal can. Yeah, well, <laughs> just because I'm sitting in this chair doesn't mean I can comment on the royal debt ceiling. We're going to get to this. I do want to frame the inflation debate, though, right now. And Lisa, it's real simple. There's this service sector angst and the goods saying someone like David Rosenberg is expert at this, but I don't think people understand the disparity of 7.1% services uh, inflation, thank you to my accountant, uh, and goods up 1.5%, almost disinflation to true deflation in but goods. The problem with this, I mean, if on one hand you could say you are seeing disinflation and then the services side will follow. 
The problem with this is you could say, all right, when services starts to cool off, you could see a reinflation of the goods. This is right. the push pull of the bifurcated economy that leaves people concerned about a stickier inflation for longer. Quick data check. It's indeterminate in the stock market. A fractional down. SPX down seven. Dow down 49. And the VIX to me is a big deal. It really just doesn't want to crawl out over 20. 18.02 on the VIX. In the yield space, I was away yesterday. Shock up four point two two year yield 4.04% and 3.50% on the 10 year. Bit dogs done nothing after that off a thousand a couple days ago, 27,585. You think Farrell quotes Bit Dog? I, I can quote Bit Dog. Guarantee that he does not. He does not. Quote and Bitcoin critically, or Bit Dog. in the spread space, I'm looking at three months tens, which is coming a little bit of disinversion, negative 180 uh, basis points. Uh, petroleum elevated over the last two or uh, three days. This is elevated to a morning brief. Lisa nailed this. She was at a 2 p.m. on inflation, when 2 a.m. on inflation Wednesday to get the brief ready. 2 p.m., 2 a.m., still here. 8, 8, 30 a.m. is when we're really looking nice for uh, that inflation read. I'm looking at the core inflation, much more than the headline inflation. The expectation is for it to come down just a touch to 5.5% year over year from 5.6%, but it was crawling higher in the prior reading. That is a problem. How hot does it have to be for this market to really sell off today? We do get sort of the other pole of the market narrative, a focus on regional banks. First Citizens, which bought SVB, is going to report earnings pre-market. They've got a 9 a.m. call. Interesting to see how this yeah. affected them, what kind of assets they really took on their books. I'm off this story right now, but the truth is it's been a three or four days of uh, just ebbing, ebbing away. Is that the right idea? Well, the interesting thing is, uh, is calm. Uh, is good, uh, is what we want, okay. right? And then if you take a look at that KBW bank index, you can see it's not done anything. So even the calm hasn't given people that confidence to go back into these. And after market, Disney is reporting earnings. Oh. I actually think this is going to be important. The shares are up almost 18% year to date. This is a fantastic read on the fate of, of, of regular cable news, right? So we get a read on that. We get a read on advertising. We get a read on the experience side of things, the services side of things. And then we get... Uh, is some sort of view into media and how the sands are shifting with the social media push and where yeah. people are really consuming uh, programming. There we are. Disney this afternoon looked to remain Bostic and Scarlet Foo for that coverage late in the uh, afternoon. Again, futures in negative seven. He is in London where he holds court as chief global equity strategist at Goldman Sachs. Peter Oppenheimer has decades of experience of extracting ourselves from the worries of the moment. Peter, thank you so much for joining us. And I love what you say in your Excellent. research note about finding neutrality, a neutral view. What do you do in the stock market when you have a neutral view? Well, Tom, we've had that view really through the last year. We've been calling the market environment fat and flat, relatively flat returns at the index level with quite wide trading bands as the market uh, assesses at different points the relative risk between recession and inflation. And I think we're at the top of that band at the moment. And what we've been arguing is that within that, you're going to get quite a lot of alpha opportunities. Generally, we've been pitching it as um, a, a, a balance between some deep value, where we think the risk to valuations are very low, and quality growth. Um, and the combination, we think, uh, is really where investors should be in a relatively flat index environment. Peter, over the past 10 years, everyone was a macro trader. And in the past six months, everyone's become a micro trader. And I go to Bank of America saying for the first time since the 2008 crisis, there is evidence of a stock picker's market of individuals going into stocks over ETFs. Is this something that you think is going to be persistent, that we are actually shifting away from some of the broad indexes and really meaningfully clients looking at specific stocks? Yeah, I think that's right. Look, in the last decade, really, equities and all asset classes have been dominated by one thing and one thing only, and that's a zero interest rate world, a very low cost of capital. Uh, and that's really driven an environment where valuations of assets have gone up. That's been a major driver of returns, which we're not likely to see again to the same degree. But it also generated an environment that was very factor-based. Everyone wanted growth because it benefited most from that backdrop of very low cost of capital, uh, and everyone was neglecting value. And I think it's much more nuanced now. You're seeing some really good earnings coming through across different sectors, 
of the markets, we're also seeing uh, different leadership geographically as well. We've been arguing that Europe would outperform the US and it's been doing rather better in the last year. I think that will continue. So I think investors need to be a bit more nuanced, more diversified across regions, across sectors and factors. And it really is, I think, an environment where stock picking and alpha creates a better uh, opportunity for investors relative to just beta and index investing. Well, that makes a, a sort of a, a concern around the fragility of markets when there is a shock that people are not prepared for. And I wonder if, for example, today with the CPI report, we end up with something that is much hotter than what people expected. If mm -hmm. there is that vulnerability, even amid all of this sort of malaise around the macro trade, to suddenly say, oh my goodness, I need to pay attention again. Yeah, I think, look, the macro is going to be critically important because we're close to inflection points and it's always an environment where investors become particularly heightened to risks or opportunities around marginal macro data. I think, as you described in, in, in the introduction, we're in an environment where inflation is still pretty sticky, well above what the central banks really want in terms of their targets. Uh, and there are some risks still on the downside in terms of the economy. At the moment, I think markets are really pricing the best possible outcome. The bond market's pricing rate cuts and inflation coming down. The equity markets are pretty much pricing a soft landing. Yeah. That combination is possible, but it's really what's priced. Uh, and I think at the margin, our view is that interest rate expectations right. need to adjust to being higher for longer to get inflation down. Peter, before we get back to inflation here, I want to tag team you and Jeff Curry together, and this is on hydrocarbons. And I look at Shell PLC, obviously with a higher dividend than what I see with ExxonMobil. Goldman Sachs on owning big oil on the continent or big oil in America, how do you choose? Well, we like energy and commodities generally. Um, we think that prices will rise from a fundamental perspective, as Jeff has been arguing. But also, these sectors are very, very cash generative. They're paying dividends, and they've got free cash flow yields, you know, in the mid-teens, particularly in Europe. Um, so energy uh, and resources were overweight in Europe. We like uh, resources in particular in, in, in the U.S., but these areas of the market, we think, have very low valuations. They don't have a lot of downside risk in terms of valuation. And they've still got an opportunity to, I think, accrete returns and compound returns right. for investors over time in a flat market. Peter, if you and Jeff Curry are ever in New York City, or we're there, or we're there in London, whatever, we'd love to get both of you on desk with us at the same That'd time. That would be just a really great uh, moment. Mr. Oppenheimer's with Goldman Sachs starting this morning with a neutral view. I did get some enthusiasm there about energy. And again, it, uh, everything I've heard the last couple of days is about where's the free cash flow. You can describe it however you want, but it's operating cash flow. Take out the capex. Here's what's left. What are you going to do with it? And there's Very a lot left because, <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, there's a lot left because where are people going to invest if they don't necessarily have the confidence uh, that their projects are going to have long-standing power if people are right. investing in other things? It's Inflation Wednesday, but at least, and you're the one that pointed this out to me, in so many things we're looking at, particularly in fixed income markets, everything's sort of in betweening, And there's this math phrase, indeterminate which is sort of a mystery out forward of are you going up, are you going down? And to me, massively, as we go to 8.30 this morning, it's all sorts of equities, bonds, currencies, commodities, signaling an indeterminate trend. What are they going to do to get out of it? We were talking with Katie Kaminsky yesterday, who's a trend follower, and we were saying, you know, what's the signal? And she said, the signal is not a signal. We're not getting anything. It's just all kind of right. nudgy. And it's sort of to your point. It's very difficult to do. Everyone's looking for a catalyst, not getting one, and then going do back you want, to Do you want to know another trend follower? John Henry. He owns a baseball team up in Boston as well. And it's a, it's a trend following that he has as well. The trend is they're above the dreaded New York Yankees. Yeah, where were you I, I yesterday? Noticed, where were yeah, you? We were up there. We were trend following. Yeah. Stay with us. It is Inflation Wednesday. Good morning. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world. With the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. In the news this morning, a lot going on, especially when it comes to inflation. We'll get to that in just a bit. Right now, we want to get to President Biden and congressional Republicans. They made little progress toward averting a first ever U.S. default. They did agree on another meeting Friday, which will again include House Speaker Kevin McCarthy. The president said he viewed the meeting on raising the debt limit as productive. 
Bloomberg's learn New York Republican Congressman George Santos has been indicted on federal charges. He had been under investigation over possible campaign finance violations. Santos took office despite fabricating much of what he had claimed about his education and career. Former President Trump plans to appeal after a jury in New York found him liable for sexually assaulting a woman and then defaming her. It's the first verdict against him in a string of legal cases that threatened to erupt the presidential campaign. The jury also ordered the former president to pay the woman, E. Jean Carroll, $5 million in damages. Jurors stopped short of finding him liable for rape. A surprise move in China. A little-known local government official has been named the top regulator overseeing the $61 trillion financial sector. Former banker Li Yunzi will be party secretary of the newly formed National Financial Supervision and Management Bureau. The agency regulates thousands of banks, insurers, and trust firms. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. centers of the world. Bloomberg Markets European Close with Guy Johnson in London and Alex Steele in New York. Real-time numbers, real-time analysis, weekdays. Today's CFOs are reshaping the C-suite. Bloomberg's chief future officer shines a spotlight on these dynamic leaders. Golf's popularity is surging. That's been great for the LPGA. And CFO Kathy Milthorpe is focused on maintaining that drive. The ability to be able to compete at the highest level and earn purses that are commensurate with their male counterparts is a mission that we're driving towards every day. Watch Chief Future Officer today on Bloomberg. In a multi-trillion dollar industry, there's a lot of ground to cover. We indeed have a rally. We're talking a lot of dividends. We're talking income. We'll show you what's happening in ETFs like no one else. Bloomberg ETF IQ, Monday on Bloomberg. Tomorrow. Bloomberg continues its coverage of the J.P. Morgan Global Markets Conference in Paris with an exclusive interview with J.P. Morgan CEO Jamie Dimon in the wake of the bank's purchase of First Republic. Join Francine Lacroix at 8.15 a.m. Eastern as they discuss the banking crisis, taming inflation, jobs, and more. It's all happening live on Bloomberg Television and Radio, your global business authority. Everybody in this meeting reiterated the positions they were at. I didn't see any new movement. The president said the staff should get back together. We explicitly asked Speaker McCarthy would he take default off the table. He refused. The United States is not going to default. It never has, and it never will. I have been considering the 14th Amendment, but the problem is it would have to be litigated. And in the meantime, without an extension, it would still end up in the same place. Be honest. Did you think the script would be anything else? Four voices there on our American tradition of a debt ceiling. We do this uh, in May, typically, and we stagger to June, July. There are the worthies, including the President of the United States, after a meeting uh, yesterday afternoon, I believe it was, at the White House. I was in transit. And, uh, you know, I'm really lucky 
uh, Lisa, that I missed the meeting. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I wasn't like sitting oh. up at 12 noon oh. going. Don't don't think you're so lucky because honestly, there are going to be so many more, and there like going to be more. Friday. Exactly. So there you go. Like Friday. So we're in this process, and you have an opinion, I have an opinion, and. Uh, we'll get to it in a moment. Futures at negative 7, Dow futures negative 44, the VIX 18.02. As I mentioned earlier, it's just flat out indeterminate. I noticed oil with a lift the last two days, American oil, $72.72. And Lisa has noted the euro has staggered and plunged from 110 plunged. down to 109.50. <laughs> it's a crate, it's cratered. Right now, to give you perspective on this foolishness, Greg Vallier, Chief U.S. Foolish Strategy at AGF Investments, is once again, we're sucked into the debt ceiling debate. Greg, is there something different this time, or have we seen this before? I do think there's something different, uh, Tom. Good morning. I think it's the militants in the House. There's at least two dozen House Republicans who really don't want to raise the debt ceiling at all. You know, they may agree to the spending cuts we got to two or three weeks ago, but if there's anything more or any watering down, I think they take a walk. So that the House is a different dynamic. Why do they have power? I mean, you mentioned two dozen. That's 24 voices among 300 XX and 100 senators, I believe it is. Okay, fine, but why do they have so much power? Well, McCarthy only has a four or five seat uh, majority. Uh, they didn't do very well in the last election. So with a majority that thin, a, a tiny minority has a disproportionate influence. Given the fact that it's a tiny majority, does uh, Representative George Santos of Long Island, the New York region, does his indictment by the Department of Justice affect anything? Not a lot. Uh, frankly, what is surprises me is that that was a bigger news story than uh, the debt ceiling. Uh, the Trump legal problems yesterday in New York w was a huge story, but uh, I think that one of the many surprising things about this debt default uh, saga is that there's no real sense of urgency. Well, part of this is because we've all seen this story before. I mean, we talked about this all of yesterday, yep. that Washington's trying to get Wall Street interested so that they could use it as a pawn to basically go back to voters and say, yep. we tried our hardest. I mean, it seems really circular. At what point do they just kind of have to bite the bullet, resolve the issue, or is it not going to get to that until there is a little bit more emotion? Yeah. <laughs> They're out for a lot of uh, June and July. So with this kind of a vacation schedule, I don't think they have time to get a deal done. Meanwhile, Janet Yellen uh, reportedly called all of the executives, the corporate executives, and they lined up dutifully and said, please don't do this. This is really dumb. You're holding the, com the economy hostage. What do you think is going to galvanize some sort of reaction, given that the rank and file, yes, you have the polarization on either side of whether you want to uh, cut the budget significantly whether you want to keep certain spending and pair others that i understand the bigger debate is why does this have to be resolved in this kind of you know brinks edge kind yeah. of uh kind of issue how is it going to end other than some sort of massive move like the 14th amendment or something worse like a default you could have that. I think you need one more ingredient, and that is a, a lot of demagoguery on Social Security. I think that's going to be a big part of the, the dialogue in the next two or three weeks that senior citizens right. might not get their benefits. I think that will certainly motivate a, a lot of politicians. But you're right. It may take something outside the box, like the 14th Amendment. I think it would be a legal fiasco if they tried to do it. But there'll be an extension. We'll get a deal. Uh, I don't think the U.S. is going to default. I agree with Mitch McConnell, but it's going to take a while. So we get an extension. The can yeah. is moveth down the road. You wrote in your yeah. morning note it's something like autumn, or maybe it's the end of the fiscal year, whatever. Why the theater? I mean, if we're going to get an extension, I don't understand why the angst right now. Oh, I think there are a lot of people, especially in the House, who sincerely worry. We've got a total debt of $31.4 trillion. All the uh, projections okay, but, are... Greg, I don't mean to interrupt, but come on, you and yeah. I have been through this five times with the late, great Pete Peterson. Where's the commission? Is that what comes out of the meeting Friday? You could, although that would be viewed, I think, very, very uh, cynically. Uh, no, I, I think there's a growing feeling among the public. You look at the polls, the public is convinced that inflation is the big problem, and inflation has been exacerbated by the spending. Right. 
So, I mean, the, in both parties, but especially the Republican Party, there's a militance that we've got to do something about spending. Well, Greg, how many people are talking about where the spending comes from, right? I mean, on both sides, there's yeah. been spending, whether it's the Trump administration or the Biden administration. From your vantage point, where has more of the spending come from? I think we're going to get in a deal eventually uh, some curves on spending. Uh, if you want federal benefits, you've got to work. Uh, they'll claw back pandemic relief. They, they'll have a cap on spending. I mean, there are the rough mm. outlines of a deal that, that we'll, we'll get. It's just that this dance is going to take months and months probably to finally get resolved. Greg Villiers, thank you so much for the brief this morning. With AGF Investments, folks, I can't say enough about Greg Villiers' morning uh, note to get no, not the zeitgeist, but just the mood out there linking economics and business into the political ballet of Washington. The ballet is happening in Tokyo. Our Anne-Marie Horton in conversation Friday with the Secretary of the Treasury. This is the G7 finance ministers uh, meetings. The timing on this is interesting. We'll have team coverage at 3.30 a.m. on Bloomberg Surveillance. I'm kidding. <laughs> but uh, this will be on a Tokyo time frame. Horton had a tantrum and said it's got to be 3.30 in my afternoon. So, okay, that's what we're doing. From Tokyo, uh, Janet Yellen as well. I've been to these meetings, Lisa, and there's a lot of body language, but there's also a conveying of the message, and you wonder what Yellen's message is going to be to Anne-Marie Horton. Especially when there's a fraught international stage and there's a fraught domestic stage, and the idea that how much does that affect the international uh, the international stature of the United States as she goes into these meetings. This is a time that is crucial to try to get support around Ukraine in order to keep going with the potential offensive. This is crucial with respect to uh, getting a number of other deals, trade and otherwise. How do you do this if people are like, what's going on at home? Are you guys going to default? Yeah, what's interesting about this being in Tokyo is, is what Korea desires or Japan desires. And yes, China, Taiwan and that down the Pacific Rim, but to remind ourselves, it was a bipartisan walk away in the United States from the Pacific Trade Agreement of, I'm guessing, seven years ago. Did you see yesterday that Italy is walking away from its yeah, uh, the Belt, road, and road, road. Uh, yeah, Belt and Road Agreement? Yeah, Belt and Road Agreement. The Yellow Brick really, Road. Yeah, <laughs> you're, doing, you're killing it. I don't kill it. Thank you. <laughs> Anytime. Uh, but this, this, to me, was really interesting because it was something that was, you know, U.S. <clears throat> representatives really pushed hard against. They're withdrawing after entering in 2018, 2019 area. I but mean, how much is this sort of, you know, again, this sort of polarization? China, Russia, Saudi Arabia, maybe. I totally agree with you. And, and what's US. fascinating is this was done by a controversial prime minister in Italy. Yes, it was. So that, you know, this is something that, I mean, I mean, we have to get Francine Lacroix up here. She didn't explain it. But the answer is, it's a big deal. There's no question about that. The big deal here is in two hours, the inflation report of the United States of America, Michael McKee, of course, with the dynamics of service sector and good sector inflation. The markets will move. Stay with us on radio and television. This is Bloomberg Surveillance.
we had a long-standing presence here in, in Houston for the past, I would say, 20-some years mm -hmm. since the compact merger. We bought a piece of land. We started building this building. And um, in doing so, we had to also recalibrate how we were building it because the pandemic hit us. And we thought about recreating a work environment that is very, very different, that is catered for this new structural way of working, which we call edge to office, where people don't always come to the office to work, can work remotely from their homes, their edges, but have to come back to the office for specific reasons, such as uh, team meetings, customer meetings, and in general, collaboration. With regards to the hybrid work model, do you see that some, as, as something that will persist longer term when the pandemic is long gone? Yes, no question, this will persist. studios in New York and San Francisco. Our expert hosts have the data and analysis about the companies you know and the startups to watch. Plus, the interviews you don't want to miss. Watch Caroline Hyde and Ed Ludlow on Bloomberg Technology, the only daily business show dedicated to tech right in the middle of the trading action. 12 p.m. on the East Coast, 9 a.m. in the West, only on Bloomberg Television, your global business authority. Bloomberg Surveillance, good morning. Good morning, Global Wall Street. Thrilled you're with us. Good morning to all of you looking two hours out to an inflation report uh, in America where we've seen inflation, well, maybe a gallon of gas under $4 a gallon in most of Manhattan. That's a good thing. $72.86 per barrel on American oil. Brent crude well under 80, 76.57, part of the inflation dynamic that Mr. McKee will slice and well, dice here at 8.30. Although I do think that core, and exactly because of that point, core will be that much more important, stripping out energy, stripping out food, some of those more volatile areas, yeah. because that's the sort of sticky area of yeah. services worlds that you are talking about. Many years ago, I dived into the research on this. Good morning to Loretta Mester and the Cleveland Fed and the Kansas City Fed that have really led the way on this. I'd also give credit to Diane Swank School the University of Michigan, where there's been a lot of academics on it. And the answer is there's 14 ways to choose to measure inflation, and none of them are any good. So you sort of pick your, you know, as Bill Aaron would say, your second best choice uh, for it. Mine has always been the Cleveland core number, which doesn't just take out oil, energy, whatever, but varies month to month on what it takes out. I'm not sure that's the best number, but that's the one I've used. You know, I love the way that you put that, because this really is the reality. It's sort of, you know, pick your inflation data and then come up with your yeah. theory. And what we're seeing right now is a host of projections from Wall Street. Let's get you some of them. Goldman Sachs is at the top of the pack, estimating a 0.5% uh, rise in the core CPI month over month. Yes, they did.